Angel Corps to arrive at New Kendall Base. Her Majesty's Angel Corps Squadron are returning to the Kendall Airship Base after travelling around the world on a mission to protect the world-famous Hodgson's Indian Pale Ale from dastardly sky pirates. The popular IPA recipe was said to have been changed by one of the factory's automatons who fell into a bath of the alcohol and was said to have started thinking after he was fixed. While the automaton apparently altered the brew without the awareness of its manager, Mr Hodgson, some say this may have saved his dying business. However, Mr Hodgson claimed he didn't realise this automaton had the ability to think, refused to supply further comment on this strange machine. The all-female squadron visited Kendall last year to see the progress on their new airship base. However, they left a rather bitter impression on the local bars and their patrons after a series of fights broke out due to the comments made by allegedly sexist barmen and customers. Hopefully the townspeople won't mind the angels returning, especially as they have chosen our lovely town as their base. Welcome to the official Lakes International Comic Art Festival podcast. My name's Ian. And my name's Nikki, bringing you the best in comics and graphic novels and updates from the festival. Hello and welcome to Lakes International Comic Art Festival episode 37. My name's Ian. And I'm Nikki. And we are almost at the Lakes International Comic Art Festival 2018. The countdown has begun. It is days away well weeks actually but you know yeah. it two. still could be classed as days though, well it? that could have been said last year exactly it's always a day in this. <sighs> you see i thought mine sounded more dramatic women. than you're going weeks away women days typical hours awkwardness minutes anyway so <laughs> today's episode we got a bumper show again for you. <laughs> <laughs> we've had uh yums and corey of Clockwork Watch fame back on the show. We have. With uh, Ryan and Honor from Kendall College as well mm-hmm. to talk about what's coming up at the festival. It's very exciting. It is. Uh, we've got Pete and Mike joining forces yet again. Yeah, we're not letting them do this again, are we? Yet again. No, this, this can't keep happening. <laughs> we have to keep them apart. It's like crossing the streams in Ghostbusters. They, they we can't let them stop. mix. <laughs> So that'll be coming up as well. Uh, we'll talk a bit about at the end of the show what we're doing for the festival. What we're doing? Um, as far as where you can find us and stuff. <laughs> and, and what we think you should be looking Everywhere. out for. <laughs> Everywhere. We will just be there. Yes. <laughs> yes, we will. <laughs> um, and we're also going to do the big Marvel versus DC discussion between ourselves. Which is what Mike and Pete rambled on about as well. <laughs> yes. Ours will just be more kind of just insults. <laughs> yes, quite possibly. <laughs> First, let's do a couple of reviews because we didn't do anything last week. Mm. Um, so, Hilda. Hilda. Uh, oh. A book by Luke Pearson, well, yes. a series of books by Luke Pearson, yeah. is now an animated series on a Netflix. Yep. Uh, and I, I, it was Tony Esmond who, who mentioned, mm-hmm. you know, this is coming out, and I was like, oh, give it a go. Yeah. And I don't think you were that interested at first. Am no, I, I don't right know why. That? Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I thought, this is going to sound awful, isn't it? I thought it was going to be more aimed at children. Which it is aimed, obviously, at children. It is, but I think it's absolutely beautiful and quirky and adults get as much out of it as a Mm -hmm. child would. And I love it. (laughs) So, essentially, it's a story of a little girl named Hilda Hilda and her adventures in Troll Town. Trollville. Trollville. I'm rubbish at remembering names. Um, well, how she ends up in Trollville. How she ends up in Trollville and, and how she lives her life going from living in the middle of nowhere into mm. a, a big city. But it, yeah, you've In got this that. crazy world full of fantasy creatures, essentially. Yeah, it's finding your place in the world, isn't it? But mm-hmm. she does that by making friends and dragging her friends into terrible, terrible situations. Um, yeah, and then living alongside magic and spirits and... Trolls. Trolls and fantastical elves. creatures, and I want twig. Elves that like paperwork. I want a deer fox. You want a deer fox? Yeah. You can't have a deer fox. Oh. Mainly because they don't exist. Okay. 
maybe if you want to get a fox and stick some twigs on I was just head. thinking that. Maybe I could stick twigs on a fox. Okay. Uh, the animation is just glorious. Oh, it's so pretty. Uh, it's it's ever so slightly different from his work, original work, but yeah, not Hilda's massively. Yeah, Hilda's got a pointy nose. Yeah, not um, massively, but yeah. you can understand they probably... It's a style for from work and animation and mm. so forth. But yeah, it, it, it's just a... Otherwise, it's quite close to... It is. It feels yeah. very much like the work. The trolls are the same and things like that. It is just gorgeous. Isn't mm. it? That's that's what's come out about it. And it is... That, that first episode especially really pulled you into the world. First yeah. two couple of episodes with the giants and so forth. And yeah. I love it. So yeah, check it out. It's well worth checking out. Um, Luke. Luke. <laughs> <laughs> I am your father. <laughs> Luke, come on the show. We want to chat with you. We're going to try. We'll see what we can do. Get Good. Luke on the show. Yes. I'm just thinking Star Wars all over now. You are now. Um, That's not very helpful. Okay. I'm going to come on the show now. No. <laughs> right, we've got a book to review each. Do you want to do yours first? Oh, yes, okay. Uh, this is Wolf by Rachel Ball. Mm-hmm. I've not got blurb to say because I've not got a physical copy, but you can blurb it, love. I will blurb it. After a tragic accident leaves his family bereft, a young boy called Hugo finds his world turned upside down. His new home comes with new neighbours. Among them, according to the boy next door, a dangerous recluse who eats children, the wolf man. Desperate to return to happier days, Hugo draws up plans for a time machine, but only the Wolfman has the parts that Hugo needs to complete his contraption, and that will mean entering the, his sinister neighbour's house. Du, du, du. So, tell me a bit about this book. Oh, this tomb. Cause it's it it's is, a very it's big gorgeous, book. It's yeah. beautiful. It's all pencil drawn in here. Um, but it is, you follow Hugo, um, who's just a normal child dealing with loss really a family that's lost a part of it i don't want to give too many spoilers you see <laughs> um so you know there's a there's a hole in in poor little hugo's life mm-hmm. and he's desperate desperate to get this person back in his life so he's got an older brother and sister so he's the youngest out of the three and um he, I think I just felt that he was he was lost and he just wants this person back. Oh. So they watch the time machine on telly, and he wants to then make a time machine to go back in time and sort this thing out. But the next door neighbour, a very thin, sinister guy, um, who supposedly eats children, um, he's got the parts that he wants to help build his time machine. What about the art style? Because this is something that jumped out to me, and it's sort of it, it's given. Me, I love the art style and because sort of I do. Me and you, a little bit more confidence. Certainly, me mm. more confidence. Well, your to, confidence, yes, yeah, so I had confidence. In yeah, you. to sort of break free from the realms of framing, framing, and so yes, forth. Yes, it doesn't need framing. Know, it's it's this book flows so fantastically well because there is no framing. It's, it's pure, it's, just pencil drawings, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's beautiful. There's it means that the flow of the story, the flow of the characters, the flow of the emotion, because it's a very emotional book. I cried at the end. So it's a very emotional book. Um it just keeps that without separating <coughs> any of the action. <coughs> also a lot of the you carry on dying there, dear. But a lot of it is like you have one picture. I mean like there's framing mm. there. <laughs> <laughs> but you have one picture. Yeah, we're saying it's framing there, but it's not been done computerized. It's no, him just no. drawing on a page, isn't it? Yeah, and, and then you haven't got framing. And then, yeah, like this one, there's nothing. It just flows from one to the other. I love it. I love that kind of think, organic feel to it. I think when we get to doing our book, which I've still got to sit down and write, I'm mm. not going to write it the way that, that normally written. Normally, it's written like you do this, and, and I'm sort of the writer's telling the artist what they want mm. i think i'm just more going to write a story like a script yeah and let you work out how to fit how to, it on a page right which is that from looking at wolf yeah that's done that. no it is mm. there's been a couple of that but wolf in particular because it's such a thick oh it's beautiful isn't book it that rachel's just gone free with it i suppose is the best mm. way to look at it but it works so well and like i say the characters i mean they're drawn a hugo i think is ever so sweet um but like his brother and sister they have those faces of teenagers that Mm -hmm. pinched you know that look that teenagers can get she gets that very well the caricatures of like of wolfman himself being so thin i mean there's a reason for that i'm not telling you why (laughs) um you know and with his with his hook nose and you know it's it's all there the caricatures she picks out and gets their character in those few you know 
that well, I can't even say it right. But she gets, yeah, she gets the personality of them through the caricatures. So I wonder well. how long it took to do that. I mean, that's. I mean, the, I say, each one is so work many, of art. Yeah. So say. many pages. Like that. I mean, you can see she is a proper teenage girl. Audio podcast. Nikki points <laughs> to image. <laughs> I'm just showing you to bring you into of a teenager this book. with big nose. <laughs> But I was just showing, you know, that mm-hmm. it's just images like that, that instantly, you know what that person actually, that person is. It's just And a how they're book. feeling right yeah. now. Yeah, it is an absolutely beautiful book. It's Lost, Love and Loneliness. Mm-hmm. That is the book. And it is amazing. And I'm yet to read it. But I will read be reading it. it. That's for sure. It's, do you know what? What? It might have knocked Tamalt off my top <gasps> book of the Uh-oh. year. At the minute, I'm in still, I'm in two minds, whether it's, Uh-oh. but I think it's up there. It's between these two now. Sorry, John. <laughs> but I, I'm absolutely loving this book mm-hmm. so much that I think it's, it's definitely, it's neck and neck between the two of them now. This is, oh, this might have pipped it. <laughs> he ain't going for a drink with us now. <laughs> he will. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know he respects all the books, to be fair, so he's not going to have an issue with that, if that's the case. But yeah, they're both so different, but they're both so emotional. Mm-hmm. That, yeah, I love them both. And Excellent. yeah, I think it's up there with it then. So what I've been reading instead, um, if I can get it over, I've only got the digital, I've not got the... Uh, the print edition as of yet, uh, is My Heroes Have Always Been Junkies by Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips. Uh, colorist Jacob Phillips. Now, whoa, computer's making noises. Um, first thing about that is how proud must you be that your son sort of followed you into a similar... Unless he turns out better well, than you and then you'll be like... Mm. Well, <laughs> sorry, Sean. <laughs> He's on his way. Um, no, but how proud must be his dad to be able to have your son, you know, who's got his own talent. Yeah. You know, because you can't, you can't train someone in some ways. No, it's to have that, talent. that is a natural yeah, talent. Yeah, it is a natural thing. Um, to then join forces and, and do a book. Yeah. That must be amazing. A lovely feeling. It must be. So My kids can't draw, so it's not going to happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll just give. I've got some bump. So let's 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 give some bump. Mm. The first original graphic novel from the best-selling creators of Criminal, Kill or Be Killed, Fade Out, and Fatal. Teenage Elliot's always been a, had romantic ideas about drug addicts. Those tragic artistic souls drawn to needles and pills have been an obsession since the death of her junkie mother ten years ago. But when Ellie lands up in an upscale rehab clinic where nothing is what it appears to be. She'll find another more dangerous romance and find out how easily drugs and murder go hand in hand. Dun, dun, dun. My heroes have always been drunk. It's a seductive coming of age story, a pop and drug central fueled tale of a young girl seeking darkness. Is this about Sean's former life? <laughs> what she finds there. <laughs> so this is basically following Ellie, um, as I say, who's in rehab mm. and she meets um, the young lad there and starts to fall in love with him. Mm-hmm. Through that, she then tells the story of why she's there. Mm. What's what sort of led her to become a drunk, as it says, isn't that there? It's, mm. it's what happened with her mother. Yeah. Throughout it also jumps a lot into music mm. and records, and, and she follows the singers, how, how their lives progress, dealing with, you know, they, a lot of artists do deal with drugs and mm-hmm. have issues with drugs. Um, that jumps out because... Obviously, Sean puts a lot of musical things up on mm-hmm. on Twitter, so it felt that even though it was his head that was written, it just felt that that was linked to Sean in a big way. Yeah, really did. Um, the art style is very washed out colours, mm-hmm. very different to it's more muted. Kill or be killed, or anything like that. So Jacobs really jumps those colours out differently to mm-hmm. to what we've had before, which makes it just feel so differently. Yeah, to their previous work. Uh, and the story is superb, mm-hmm. as you'd expect from a Brubaker, to be fair. <laughs> There's not much more you can say. You know, he, what he's going to write is going to be a, yeah. a quality piece of work. Um, I think it's his first sort of proper romance story, mm. but it's still got the, the grittiness that you'd expect from uh, Brubaker and Phillips. Mm-hmm. So that's going to be released at the festival. <gasps> uh, Jacob and Sean will be signing. So, yeah. <laughs> must get a it's, copy it's a, and get it It's a it must signed. have, is that one. If you like any of their previous work, this is so different, mm-hmm. but still that same quality yeah. shining through. 
So grab that for sure. Mm. We will be because I don't want digital. It's not the same. It's not like holding it's it in your hands, is it? It's not the same. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> you get excited about it. We get 10 times more excited about the, the print. When the book comes through, yeah. Yeah. Like that one there. Oh, I love this book. <laughs> <laughs> so Marvel versus DC. What do you mean, dear? I don't see how this could be a versus person. Um, fact, <laughs> we'll, we'll, Marvel versus DC. We're coming to in a minute. Because right. I've forgotten a few bits. Oh, have you now? First, Pete's comic Monster Kids is yes. now on Comic House. Yes. So go and read it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lyndon White. Lovely <gasps> Lyndon. Oh, yes. Uh, he's, he's writing a new book. He is. Obviously. It's a book that's coming out on Unbound, which is a bit like Kickstarter mm-hmm. in its own sense, uh, called Candles. Yeah. Uh, being announced next month. What what what's your first take? Because we've seen a few pages yes. of this, and and I'm one of the things he said is this. that it's your style. <laughs> yeah, Nick, you were like this, yeah, and he's not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I instantly thought, hmm, looks a bit ghibli esque. This. Well, he says himself. Yes, to I be felt fair. a bit of a Howl's Moving Castle kind of come. Um, yeah, it's a bit of Howl coming in there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I love it. Magic, brilliant. Right up my Yeah, we've only seen a few pages, yeah. but it, it, from Six what pages. we've seen. <laughs> <laughs> I devoured what, them all. <laughs> the, the the art is gorgeous. There's mm-hmm. a first page, which sort of is sort of a landscape yeah. of this, this forest and, and small town. Um, yeah, no, it's looking really good. Yeah, I'm really so looking forward to it. we want to keep up on this. So as we see more, we'll talk about it because it'd be interesting to see this project mm, develop. I want to see how this story is going to go. Yeah, because we've seen very little yeah, of that so far, just, so we'll... Uh, just our, our wizard. So keep your eyes out on that. If you're going to the festival, have a chat with Lyndon yes. about it. I'm sure he'll have some preview stuff mm-hmm. there as well. Um, and try some of his other books yeah. while you're there. Yep. Right, there we go. Now I've done the bits that I forgot about. That you forgot about. Mar- yeah. No, I doing well. Right, Marvel versus DC. Yes. Don't insert, look at me like that. <laughs> insert dramatic music here. <laughs> I may well do that. Like um, Marvel vs. DC. So that is going to be the opening event at the festival this mm-hmm. year. Emma Viacelli hosting a battleground of a battleground. creators. There's going to be carnage, is there? There's going to be carnage. There's going to be carnage. And I'll Venom. be on the winning side, so I shouldn't worry about it. Joke. And, and Venom. Venom. <sighs> Thank you very much, everybody. My name's Ian. <laughs> I'm here all week long. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, they're going to be discussing... Who's best between the two? Marvel. <laughs> so we've done a poll. We'll, we'll, did I win it? We'll get to that in I a did, minute. Didn't we've I? got some shout outs. In fact, should we do the poll first? Oh, oh, is that? We'll, oh, we'll, we'll go now to I'm our feeling like personal, you probably won it now. Personal opinions. Yeah. Okay. So, no. Well, I say me and you. It's not about me and you. Nick. It is because we're on different sides it's of the fence. It's not about me and you. So, so if asked, you took Batman out of DC and had that as a separate thing, just, what would just, be your answer just, then? Just huh, 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 huh. <laughs> So the question was, who do you prefer, DC or Marvel? Marvel? Now, I did put comics, but I'm well aware that the films are going to jump into these decisions a lot as well. Mm. Um, it's not just going to be down to what they think of certain comics. So I'm just bringing it up on Twitter. I'm glad I was organised for this. You are very organised today. There we go. So, Marvel came out 58% yes. against DC's 42%. It's quite close, really. I mean, obviously I win on this, but it's quite close. It's closer than I thought. No, probably not, actually. So, we've got mm. that comic spell. Um, Tom from the comic spell is DC. He's a is man. he? He's, he's always been a fan of DC. Strike him off my Christmas card My list. first superhero comic being the death of Superman. Wow. Uh, everyone knows them. Batman, Superman and Wonder Woman. Also, more Swamp Thing and Watchmen. Enough said. However, the podcast that he, he the, that comic spell podcast that he uh, does stuff for, yep. um, sort of looks a bit like Marvel. <laughs> Marvel for the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send them a Christmas card. <laughs> uh, Dan Butcher from the Awesome Comic Podcast. Marvel uh-huh. comics were always available in my news agents as a boy. DC was rarely available. This bedded a lifelong love of the characters in the universe. You see. And I have X Men. David Thompson, who I like. DC, because I would <laughs> rather have a great story to read than nice pictures. Um, <laughs> I'm up for the pictures. <laughs> James Gray, I only choose DC as I've neglected them over the years. 
but have read the hell out of Marvel. Mm. Uh, Robert Ferrey, I just like the characters more in Marvel. <laughs> George Needle Needbell, so we'll we'll leave it at that. Uh, just says Marvel, fine. Mm-hmm. Let, let's let's look. There's a few more. Go on, Matt Garvey. <gasps> now he knows his stuff, doesn't he? He's a man who knows his stuff. Currently, I'd say DC. Oh, <gasps> he's off my Christmas because card list. Some stuff, good stuff coming from the Black Label uh, and Joe Medals. I've who again knows his stuff. Mm. I've always been a DC reader, but one of my favourite super comics of all time is Daredevil: Born Again from Marvel. Um, <laughs> so it's it. To be honest, it's whoever's got a good storyline at the time, isn't it? No one's no one say that they only read Marvel. Or no, that they was only never the question. DC. It was no, never I know. the case of it's it's one which you prefer mm. between the two. But they're quite like I said, they're close in the polls. So it's whoever's inching, and I think the films of inch. Marvel ahead. The films of, of Inch Marvel massively ahead. The, the films have done a lot for the brand as a whole. Mm. But a lot of it is down, I feel, to what you grew up with as well. Yeah. What were your lead characters growing up? Yeah. For me, it was always oh, Batman. Yeah. Other than 2000 AD, Batman. You see, I love Batman and I love... so, But I think on the whole, Marvel have done it better. Okay, explain your argument then. Because they've got X Men, and I liked X Men like, comics as because, I was a kid. Because <laughs> they've done it better because they have X Men. <laughs> <laughs> is that your argument? That is literally it. <laughs> and Deadpool, and uh, but that's later on <laughs> as an adult around Deadpool. So I can't really. Con- but from a, as a kid's point of view, then it was Marvel comics I could get hold of a little bit easier. Because I lived in the in the country. I lived <laughs> I lived in a zoo. <laughs> there was no shop, <laughs> so it's whatever I could get with my pocket money, but only in the summer holidays. So, yeah, Marvel. It would be an X Men comic just so that I could draw X Men, which I okay. used to do a lot. And we- but what one of the big characters in Marvel? Yeah, if not the biggest, is Spider Man. Yeah, I don't like Spider-Man. You don't like Spider-Man? <laughs> no, but I don't like Superman either, so it kind of equals out there, so we're fine. <clears throat> There's logic there. Of course, yes. <laughs> There's no logic. There's no logic there whatsoever. No. Well, I don't have to like all the... People are saying that in your little poly thing you did. <laughs> don't have to like everything all the time. Okay. I happen to love X-Men, and that and that is a lot of characters. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask you one question here. <laughs> Please don't. Who's got the best set of villains? Oh, Batman's got the best set of villains, hands down. We all know that. <laughs> so DC as a whole, really. <laughs> yeah. It's not just Batman as well. It's no, when you think, I think of the Green no, Lantern no, and so forth. No, you and... see, I'm not bothered by that. I'm not even bothered by Spider-Man's villains. They're not that good. But I think um, Batman, because it's so dark and gothic, he has the best villains. Mm. But uh, that's, I don't care. Uh, because <laughs> X-Men. <laughs> and I want you to be Rogue. This is it. <laughs> I want you okay. to be Rogue with Gambit. <laughs> I'm fine. Okay. I mean, one of the interesting things is a lot of Marvel's characters, I mean, don't get me wrong, DC copied Marvel, but mm. Marvel copied a lot more DC characters. Oh, yeah, they've all copied each other the down day. the years. Yeah, yeah. Um, which makes for sort of interesting read that people then prefer Marvel's. What is it What is it Marvel have done, I suppose? Are they a bit more light-hearted, maybe? Yeah. I don't know. I think they don't take, well, obviously some of the storylines do take themselves seriously, but they haven't taken themselves as seriously. I think the films have helped that as well in the fact that they don't take it as seriously and they know how to inject humour and colour. You know, they they shoot things in the daylight. Mm-hmm. You know, DC haven't found daylight yet. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's dark. <laughs> so, yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> Even Justice so, League looked like it was done on a dark and dank day. Well, that's just a film. <laughs> so let me just talk through DC. So, Batman was early on for me. They, they, had a, they used to do a monthly... UK based Batman comic. Well, you were posh. How was I posh? You know, I had to make Batman was a stick in my life. Um, but also in the early days when I when I found the the batches of comics you could buy, it included the Green Lantern, mm. uh, the Flash was in there, Mister Miracle was in there. It was a collection of DC comics, Justice League. It was Justice League Europe, I remember. Mm. So those characters jumped out at me who had never seen before. I personally don't feel. The Avengers matches up 
to Justice League for the range of interesting characters and In the amount the of interesting characters. Yeah, forget film. I was going to say, let's not even go Um there. I feel DC and comics pull their characters together better than Marvel do in the comics. And they utilise all characters and their storylines together mm. far better. I wouldn't know. <laughs> I win. Um, <laughs> no, that's not fair because I'm not... <laughs> I didn't have access to these things. And if I feel, you said it was better, Bino or Dandy, and I'd been all right, all right? <laughs> I feel that the films will never be able to show how Batman works with the Justice League. No. I don't think it, 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 it just, Batman is too, in the movie, settled in reality almost. And that's how he's always going to be, and I don't he's think you can change that. But a in the comics. hero pumped for you know, it feels more linked in the comics to what it will ever will in film. Mm. So I don't think, if we're looking at the film side of Marvel and DC, mm. DC will never be able to match up to Marvel just because their lead character can't work on the screen with his other characters, I don't feel. Because they can't do it, yeah. They just can't. It just I don't know why. I just can't ever see it working. Mm. But in the comics, you know, you've got all these different characters. You've got Superman who's trying to be Mr... Good all the time. Nah. You got the the Flash, <laughs> depending on which Flash version it is. Wally West being silly, yeah, destroying. But that's not coming across. time and so forth. Yeah. And and you've got the Green Lantern Corp alone, of their own universe. Yet mm. they fit so well within the the, the Earth realm as yeah. such. Yeah, but you see, Marvel got Deadpool, so it's fine. I mean, Marvel have got some great characters. I mean, the Hulk is probably one of my favourites. You see. Yeah. You can't have him as your favourite now, because you're DC. I said he's one of my favourites. <laughs> and that is something I don't feel DC have got anything like. The Hulk no. is just this rampaging character. Yeah. Uh, but, like I said, DC's villains, They're, in my opinion, are just... I mean, a lot of it, a lot um, of them are Batmans. Yeah, I was going to say, it's Batman's villains, because Batman is a much darker... It's a much more grown-up... But then they work again with, with the Justice League, though. They all work with... Yeah. You know. And a bit like Tom, the, the two stories that really got me in were Nightfall mm. and the death of Superman. Mm. Seeing those characters being destroyed. Made human. Even though they come yeah. back. Um, yeah, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> seeing those characters destroyed, seeing, in my opinion, the best enemy, full stop, Bane, being You've created. You've had the, the whole Wolverine, Logan death, though. Yeah, oh, there's so many characters always killed, but yeah. that is just... You gotta think those two characters more than any characters in the comic world. They're sort of firsts. Mm. You know, and, and having those die was just mm. yeah. I don't think any other character dying had the same or will have the same mm. gut punch as when those two Yeah. Broke the back and died. Yeah. So yeah, for me it's always gonna be DC. No one's gonna change my mind. They might. No, they won't. <laughs> Like in a cult. <laughs> love DC, love the comics. Shame about the films. Love Marvel, love the cartoons. <laughs> well, if we're going there, DC does better with the cartoons. <laughs> Only with Batman, the animated series. Superman was good. Ah, oh, no. No, no, no. The Justice Clicks have been good. No, no. Teen Titans, go away. <laughs> So that's our opinion. What you're going to hear later on in the show is a much more deep <laughs> opinion with two far more knowledgeable gentlemen. Yes. Mike yeah. and Pete. Yeah, not just us two. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, you've got a good hour's worth of entertainment there coming up shortly mm -hmm. after we hear Yoms mm -hmm. and Corey. And then we'll be back to talk about this year's festival. Let's do it. This is reporting for the Gazette. With the Angel Corps arriving shortly, I was sent to question the police about what their overall opinion of their arrival is. Immediately upon entering the station, I could already feel some unease, noticing a distinct separation with the numbers and some tension in the air. I was then led to a staff room where I could sit down and wait for the officers to come and talk to me. Officer Jack Woods, the first to talk to me, said he felt that he and a few other officers he was slightly wary of the Angel Corps' arrival, because they were unsure of how it might affect their authority in Kendall. With the Angel Corps serving under the Queen's orders directly, 
they can be viewed as having a higher status than that of the local police. This may cause a few issues for the police as the public could see this as a chance to surpass any police laws if they clash with a member of the Agile Corpses. A similar opinion was shared by Officer Ethan Johnson, saying that he was also cautious about their arrival due to the history of sparking violence within the taverns. He believes it will be difficult to continue maintaining the police if such an esteemed force causes problems within the town. Alternatively, Officer Ryan Wilson believes that their arrival can be viewed as a positive. Thanks to them, he feels the police can hold a firmer grip on crime in Kendall, with the strength of the two groups possibly working much more effectively than one. Whilst there is indeed a slight difference of opinion within the police, they have said they will continue to work as a key part of the community and uphold the peace. We have a first for the podcast this day, Ooh. a returning guest that we've not just seen at a festival, but returning guests mm-hmm. onto the show that we've previously chatted to. We have uh, Yoms and Corey of Clockwork Watch fame, mm-hmm. plus many other things, obviously. Um, but more important <laughs> than that, more important than them, really? we've got two students from uh, Kendall College, Woo. Uh, Ryan Hello. Cook and Honor Shaw. Hi. How are we doing, guys? We're good. I'm good. So good, thank you. We're here to talk about the events that are happening at the Lakes International Comic Art Festival this year. Um, in regards to Clockwork Watch. So, I think first of all, can you give a very, uh, Yoms, a very basic overview, and we'll go into more detail later on, of what's going to happen on, on Saturday at the, the Lakes? Um, yes. Well, what we, we, we are very honoured to have been given a lot of scope and a lot of time to, to create the sort of immersive uh, experience that Clockwork watch has been known for for the past nine years and it all starts with um, a workshop and the workshop is to actually break down the process through which we can not just construct a graphic novel or a comic story but actually port some of those elements into an immersive experience into an immersive interactive and participatory experience in other words you take something off a page and you, you create uh, a moving, living, engaging, um, interactive piece with characters on the street or in, um, in a space. And that is the first part of the jigsaw puzzle. Uh, while that is going on, there will be other little interactions that are taking place um, around Kendall, um, all to do with uh, the little bigger picture the bigger story um surrounding uh well more or less that's inspired this which is uh the arrival of her majesty's angel corps the only female airship squadron in in the british um airship fleet and uh within our story queen victoria has given them their own base in kendall and that is more or less the crux of what we're bringing to the table. The, 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 the project itself is called Homecoming, and it is the um, arrival or an advance party of uh, Angel Corps officers um, setting foot in Kendall for the very first time. And then that carries on through the day into the night. So how do you go on about planning something like this initially? What, what's the first stages you look at? Well, first stage is you look for the inspiration and you look at the location and you look at how you want to develop the story. For us, we've been very fortunate to to be launching this in the, the centenary of um, women's suffrage mm-hmm. and to have an all-female airship squadron, you know, that aligns with that particular, um, the, that particular date is, is great. Um, the other part of the jigsaw puzzle, which, in true honesty, I don't think we could have we could have even attempted to do this, is the connections that um, the Lakes Comic Art Festival has given us with um, Kendall College, mm-hmm. and and without the students of Kendall College, I don't think we'll be working on this project right now because it's a massive task, and we're working with students who drama is is their middle name. So, you know, it's it's just an easy entry for us through and through. How do we prepare? Well, we work with students, and that's what we've been doing for the past number of months. Mm-hmm. And with that process, in regards to the students, we're going to talk to a couple of you guys in a second. Um, were they involved in altering 
the creative process at all, or was that all set out before you you met the guys? Well, we knew. I, I mean, we knew what we wanted to do and how the story was going to develop. Um, we knew that uh, to anchor the piece and to give it a certain amount of resonance, it had to be based in Kendall. Kendall needed to have skin in the game, simple and straightforward. The, but the characters, the, the, the story itself, um, a lot of the interactions that are going to be taking place have all been workshopped with the students. This is their gig, first and foremost. Yeah, very. I'm, I'm kind of jealous that I was, I'm not a college. I don't know, we're so old. <laughs> not that old. We are. Um, <laughs> I mean, that was only last week, right? <laughs> so, uh, Ryan and Anna, first of all, an important question. Um, Yom, Yom came up. Did Corey, did you come up as well, or is it just Yom's that came up? It just Yom's came up for, the, for that particular time. I came up with, um, with Yom's initially when we was kind of scoping out the uh, the ins and outs for the first kind of bits and pieces yeah. but yoms has been up there with all these wonderful talented students since then so, to really uh, make sure that everything was hammered down so an honest honest question to you guys how was he to work with <laughs> <laughs> on. yeah silence that, that's, that's <laughs> even <Silence>. positive <laughs> no it's um uh, it's been a pleasure, to be honest. He's yeah. a very uh, free-minded guy, and uh, he's got a lot of really interesting uh, ideas that you know can be expanded into such big creations. Like if you look at uh, all the work that he's put into the Clockwork series, mm. it's come so far, and there's so many complex I- ideas in this story. It's just really interesting to work with someone who's built this from the ground up. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Oh my God, that check's got to be in the post. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, uh, Anna, tell us a bit about your character. Well, I'm playing one of the squadron members from Angel Corps, which is a massive deal, obviously, um, seeing as they're the only all-female force. <laughs> and we weren't given much information about our characters specifically, just that they were part of this really, you know, badass cool force that served for Queen Victoria herself and I just it's it's been an absolutely amazing experience I've found all of the work that we've done so far and all of the character development really exciting and interesting as I've never you know been in anything like this before you know I've never quite had such an amazing experience so as part of your course or or your previous work what have you done have you just is it more stage work that sort of thing Um, Well, we are a performing arts course, so not only do we do drama, we sing and dance as well. Mm -hmm. And we've done a few plays and a few bits and bobs, but we are mostly focused on, you know, musical theatre, stage work. So to have have something like this come along, which is, you know, something that none of us have ever done before, Mm -hmm. it's it's amazing. It's an amazing opportunity. Brilliant. And Ryan, what's, what's your character? I'm playing one of the broken clockwork servants. Okay. And um, I just think that the character has a lot of depth mm-hmm. and um, it's interesting in, in how they act in society. Mm-hmm. Um, and how do you feel the world fits in as well? There's a lot to explore. Uh, there's a lot of, it's almost like opening up a jo- Pandora's box. There's just <laughs> so much stuff that stumbles out and you can find yourself on the really big aspects of the story and you can find yourself on the small parts of the story like the uh, the newsletter website. Mm-hmm. There's loads and loads of information on there and <laughs> it just it's such a big universe to be a part of. It's, it's wonderful. So can you tell us both a bit about the online side of things and what's been going on there? So uh, yeah. at the moment we've been working in classes and we've been writing articles that go up on the uh, the website mm-hmm. just to uh, give little hints and little teases about what's mm-hmm. coming up and uh, just, just some things that hardcore fans and other fans can appreciate okay. to hint towards the event. That's brilliant. Mm-hmm. It really is. We've, uh, we'll, be, we'll be recording some of them oh, yes. as well. So uh, looking out for them. <laughs> we'll be doing our, our own take <laughs> take upon your material i mean just 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 to add i think i think the guys are doing themselves they're doing themselves a little disservice here they have 
come up with everything. Mm. They have come up with the names, the characters, the background. You know, what, what they're actually doing is it's almost like a microcosm of looking at looking at a, a town somewhere where you have the haves and the have-nots, mm -hmm. the rich, the poor, the people who are for, the people who are against, the bigoted, the sexist, the racist, mm -hmm. you know, the, those who just hate everybody or those who are the nicest people on the planet. They have collectively co-created a world mm -hmm. that sits a subset to the day-to-day -day life that's going on in Kendall. And we're going to be releasing this stuff <laughs> time over time, bits and bits and bobs so people can actually read up and it's almost like reading up on a world that's just outside your front door that you didn't actually know existed mm -hmm. it's meant to run parallel to life in kendall and that is what they've created and it's amazing I'm, i mean i i last night i had in excess of 20 entries 20 20 articles from the students each touching a different aspect you know, I mean, there's a there's a, a gent um, who who's written a beautiful piece, um, Aiden, who who's written this piece about you know this rich guy and he's he's overtly sexist and everything. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you met Aiden, you'd be surprised <laughs> that this stuff is coming out. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and it's it's really I, and and then you've got honors piece as well, and you know, and then you've got you've got the people who are. You know, people like Ryan who are getting into the subset, and this, this, this whole idea. He said that he had jo broken, jailbroken clockwork. Mm. Well, clockworks are automatons who have certain rules, a bit like Asimov's three mm. rules. They follow every single direction. They are automatons. They are clockwork servants. But within the story, we have found a way of jailbreaking them and giving them sentience. <laughs> so he is one of those people. How they would react? Well, I don't know. I can't dictate that. But between them, they have, and there are about three or four of them. And what was cool is during during the the workshopping, you know, they 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 kidnapped. When they were role play, they kidnapped. <laughs> The you know, automatons that wasn't still broken took him into a room and tried convincing him that he needs to be free. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite the activity. <laughs> oh, that was that was fun. That was it was just beautiful. Mm. You know, you couldn't really. I mean, I've worked with professional people up and down, all around, uh, here and there, and 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 the, the enthusiasm that these guys have brought to the table is just unparalleled. I mean, you should check out online and watch watch Angel Call. Angel Call um, par par Parade, marching around this, the, the the outside of the car park. I mean, these guys can, they, they they've got they've got weapons. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I was at work that day. That sounds of it. <laughs> no, it's it's honestly, I'm I'm super super excited. And there's there's another part of this that if it pays off, and I hope it does. Um, we may be able to make it happen. I, I am going to fight for it. Mm -hmm. But if we this really works the way I want it to work, there's the offshoot of another follow-up event. And if that goes ahead, I am going to find a way of getting some of the gang involved. Brilliant. Yeah. That's that's just. I can't say much about that event, but <laughs> it's uh, it's 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 not local. Mm -hmm. okay. Damn it! <laughs> oh. I'm not happy with that. Know, sorry, <laughs> I, my my lips are sealed. I know exactly what you're talking about. My lips are sealed. <laughs> uh, so, Anna, how are you feeling about doing the performance on the, in particular, the Saturday night and that whole build up to that? How, how's it feeling? Is it going to be a bit of nervous energy, or? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, it's extremely nerve wracking, especially because the element of improvisation is. Um, you know, all wrapped up in the situation because we don't we don't know what's going to happen. We haven't we don't even know what the scenario is yet. A lot of it is a surprise to you know oh. to see what us actors can do on the spot, and especially because there's you know members of the public in there who will react yep. differently to us. And indeed, yeah, it's it's all based around the element of surprise completely. I think because. It's you know we 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 have, we've got no idea of predicting what's going to happen. So yeah, it's a very nerve wracking experience, but I'm I'm st stupidly excited. I can't I can't <laughs> wait. 
I think it's something it's, just to it, put on the CV it, almost, isn't it? You know, look, look what I did. Yeah, look what that, I yeah did. absolutely. You know. I mean, it's, it's almost like a man walks into a bar <laughs> and you fill in the rest of the story. <laughs> 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 Uh, Corey, can you tell us a bit about what's going on on the Saturday morning? Because there's a, a class in the morning, isn't there? There is. There is a set class in the morning. I think really kind of dovetailing into what Ryan and Anna and Dirt and Yon have been saying, <laughs> really Clockwork Watch is is all about immersive experiences. It's all about bringing people into this very rich universe that, that Yomi has, has masterfully crafted. And the workshop that we're running is is a massive part of that, of allowing people to sit down in a room with us, which thankfully we've been allowed to do because <laughs> I'm sure our, our wives uh, would say otherwise that we should not be allowed in a room together with the public. Um, <laughs> sit down with, with the public and, and say, guys, this is, we want you to create part of Clockwork Watch. And in the process of doing that, you get to experience a little bit like what it's like to enter the creative process. So what that means really in more minute detail is that we allow the participation of the audience to create a character. Now, this character will ultimately be part of the angel core. So there are a set number of perimeters there that we'll have. But other than that, we're, we're kind of giving them a bit of carte blanche to be able to put a little bit of their own stamp, their own print onto this huge interactive universe and in the process they also get to have an idea as to what we go through as creators Mm -hmm. Um, not just myself and yoms but creators in general whether they're actors musicians artists what have you uh, and understand the process that it is when you're making these minute decisions whether there's the name of the character and how that dovetails into their actual personality um, their physical presence their ability, their their core wound, which is always a, a vital part of creation of any, any character that makes them interesting and what makes them empathetic and so on and so forth. Just that obviously they'll actually have that uh, that character there and be able to see, hopefully by the end of the night, how that character would also fit into this kind of ravaging, rampaging uh, lady squad that is basically all-encompassing and, and undefeatable. So it really empowers people <coughs> have an idea as to what goes on in this whole crazy wacky uh, mind of uh, of the creative process in itself it's amazing what's just come from from the world you've created yes you know you started off with a story back back however long it was yoms <laughs> and it's yeah. you, you've well, got to this it's it's and, and it just continues doesn't it as well it's it's amazing well we we as i said we I, I keep on using the term fortunate i mean First, you know, as I say, credit, credit to, to the students over at Kendall College because what they're now doing is they're building on, uh, on an experience that has already been, um, that, that has already taken place at um, the Royal Observatory in London, at um, the National Maritime Museum, at the Arizona um, State um, Library of Scottsdale, in Scottsdale, Arizona, but, but also in big art festivals like Latitude. So they're building, they're building on top of that. And for us, well, we, we, the story, this, it's a living story and it has never solely been us. We have always created enough facets for the public to actually get engaged and become part of. I mean, one of the things, to, uh, it's more or less the flexibility, also the flexibility of being self-published indie. Mm-hmm. This year, anniversary, women's suffrage, um, um, Angel Corps, all-female troop. We are going to be (laughs) recruiting women only to join Angel Corps. Even though it's a fictional sort of concept, there will be desks where where women can sit down and have the process and go through a form and go through a questionnaire process and sign up to be part of this fictional world, you know. Um, how men are going to take that is another thing altogether, <laughs> but truth be told, within the age we're talking about, men just about got everything they wanted. Yeah. So we're turning the tables itself, you know. Mm-hmm. And and it's not so much as alienating people, we're just telling a story as it would have been told, mm. but just giving it our own unique twist. Um, where do we go from here? Well, we've got several more books to to, to go. We've got the secret thing that um, Corey and I are not allowed to talk about. <laughs> um, 
Um, when that if that happens, I can only say stratospheric comes to mind because mm. it's going to put us on the doorstep of uh, of 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 some some of the greats, and and we hope to take you know take advantage of it. But um, it's 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 what we play with. It's and what we what do we have to play with? Well, the interaction that participants bring to the table, and that inspires us to go. We started out saying. Corey, did I say it was going to be one book? <laughs> then it became three. Now we're yeah, eight. Yeah. Books nine and ten are being worked on right now. It's brilliant. Yeah. But it's such a good series, though, so, you know, mm. why not? That, that's the way to look yeah. at it. You know, it's such a, an amazing world. Mm. That's what it is. It's a world. Yeah. 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 It, it's, it's, it's growing. It is growing. And for me, the best part of this really will be if some of the students over at Candle College are able to take some of these elements and build their own stories. Yeah. The Angel Core story solely within the graphic novel world is going to be based out in the States. Angel Core as a main battalion squadron are going to be doing things in America, whereas they have a team at home who are the advanced guard mm -hmm. dealing with you know, setting up base, um, road testing things, staying away from London that's covered in a pea super smog, you know, all those things. And it would be great if the students at Kendall College can actually develop their own stories, their own comics, their own world. And because all of this in itself is being done under Creative Commons, as long as they reference Clockwork Watch, they can do whatever they want to do with the story. Mm. Brilliant. Yeah. You know, that's so really it is generous, in there. Really. Yeah. Part of this goes beyond the class, beyond the event. Mm -hmm. They can take it as far as they want. So you've got the event in the morning, then you've got things happening throughout the day. Um, so if you're yes. coming along, you need to be keeping an eye mm -hmm. out for that. And then the evening, it all closes with... Uh, well, well, we'll find Angel out. Angel Corps arrive probably... in the evening. <laughs> Angel Corps touchdown in the evening. And just to say... We have they well their uniforms look amazing. I'm so so glad. Honor is one of the um, one of the, um, the the squadron leaders because the squadron leader's outfit is probably one of the most exciting outfits. It's beautiful, absolutely amazing, and the girls are going to look awesome and they're going to be wearing the stuff throughout the day. And I gather someone to come back on Sunday Absolutely. just to show off. You know, and you've got a different, and the, the reason why I say beautiful, because within this world, every single lady in Angel Corps will have her own unique twist on how a uniform looks. Because they are the Queen's own friggin' squadron. <laughs> and, you know, and nothing stands up to that. So if you've got a pass, you've got to yes. get yourself along. Is it half eight, I think? From the town yes, hall, I'm thinking eight. right, and then then that goes on down to uh, the new union, yes. which is a bar yeah. in Kendall. Well, as as a part of it, part of it is Angel Corps are going to have a homecoming parade. Mm -hmm. It will be yeah. great to join the homecoming parade, yes. weather permitting. Mm -hmm. We are going to have fire on the streets. <sighs> Get excited we'll already. <laughs> We will be there. There will never be the same again. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to do it. You got to do it right. Um, and weather permitting, we are going to have fire on the streets. Mm -hmm. Not just normal fire, but we're going to have fire, a fire instrument. Oh wow! On the street. So we're going to walk through Kendall to get to the Union, where they've got a band and and TikTok IPA. Now this is what's ringing in my ears. <laughs> well. <laughs> Okay, there's a, a brief story here, which is um, in the 1800s, um, a, a brewery in, in London called Hodgson's um, created a beer that was meant to be sent out to Asia. Um, and because it was going to be on the boat for a very, very long time, they loaded it with hops. Hops are what you use to make beer. Um, and it tasted sickly and yuck. But because it took several months to get to where it was going in India, um, the movement of the boats, atmospheric conditions, temperature fluctuations, and all the rest, when it arrived in India, 
its complexity had changed. It was it had become a pale looking liquid. Hence the term mm. India Pale Ale. Mm. Now, the first beer to be sent out, one of the first, was Hodgson's. Hodgson's brand is owned by a dear friend of mine, even though the beer hasn't been tasted pro- pro- commercially since Queen Victoria was alive. Um, a friend of mine bought the original recipe and the brand name, and he is creating a special batch of the beer for the very first time since the 1800s, wow. and that's going to be available on the night. <laughs> <laughs> it's so exciting. Um Brilliant. That, I, I, I mean, this. But this... everyone's going to be drinking beer because there's some people who are a little bit too young to drink beer. <laughs> <laughs> See, when, being old is good now. <laughs> when we heard about this many months ago, we, we just got so excited because it's something so different yes, for the festival. Absolutely. So different for Kendall as well because yeah. we, we don't get events like this in any way, shape, or form. No. This way. No, um, you should. You should, and well, we you should. will. Yeah, no, we definitely should, because, I mean, they do a lot in Kendall, but this is yeah. something completely yeah. different, and it gives I mean, the people at the college a chance to, to, to do new things as well, and mm. it's absolutely well, superb. Wouldn't it be crazy if we weren't involved next year and the college actually did their own thing? I don't see why they couldn't. What do you two guys absolutely. think? Absolutely. That is, that, is, that, is that is the whole gig, to yeah. light that fire, to plant that seed and let it go. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Right. One final question, an important one. <laughs> um, because of the opening evening of the festival, they're doing a Marvel versus DC battle. So, Honor, <laughs> first of all, do you prefer Marvel or DC, whether it be comics or films? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> You've got to give one. It's not tough. <laughs> There's I'd one say... real answer. <laughs> I'd say Marvel. Woo! The Marvel. Okay, Ryan? Well, I mean, considering after the last film, we lost quite a few quite a few characters. <laughs> I, I, still think, I still think Marvel take the W. Oh, yes! I still yes! think. Right, I'm relying on the big boys here. <laughs> <laughs> Corey. For Corey next. Corey. <laughs> oh, you threw me under the bus. Um <laughs> I, I, I've i got to say that from a very young age, I've written, read, I'm sorry, written? I'd love to write, right? Both. <laughs> I've read both comics, both comics uh, and I, I've got to say, it's got to be Marvel. Yes! Oh, Yoms, please, don't let me down. <laughs> there is, to be honest, there is no contest. There is none. Uh, I mean, from, from the likes of Shang-Chi... To to um, you know to Stark to Loki to I mean where the hell do you begin and end? <laughs> you know it just this conversation stop. that's what ends. <laughs> it just doesn't stop. You know, but you go and let some crazy friggin' Titan loose. He <laughs> starts rampaging with a friggin' glove. <laughs> I mean, what sort of weirdness is this? It's got to be Marvel. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yay, my Marvel Well, team I was going to say, let's meet up for a drink over the weekend, but sod off. <laughs> we'll meet up for a drink. That's fine because I love Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, DC. Uh, I, I, you've done some amazing stuff, but Christ, Marvel has me by the shorts and curlies and it sure as hell's not letting go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Especially thank you to Ryan and Honor there for coming on the show. Mm, That's absolutely thank brilliant. You. Thank you. Thank you for having um, us. Thank you for having us. If any of you guys, I'm going to say this on the on the podcast now, mm. you, you're all musically talented and so forth. If you've mm. got anything you want playing on the show, and that's for all the Kendall College yep. students, we'll play any of your music if you want on the show. Mm-hmm. Not a problem Woo-hoo! at all. That's so, amazing. Thank you. Anything that's original. It's got to be original yeah. because of copyright and blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll have some drum and bass. Out. <laughs> we'll love it, love it. <laughs> so yeah, any pass that on to all the guys. Anything we want, we'll uh, we'll yeah. slap it on the show happily. Mm-hmm. happily thank you. The world. Thank you. Um, and and Yom Zakoy, thank you again for coming on the show. Yes, thank it's you. It's been a pleasure. Been a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, can't wait to see you in a few weeks' time. Now. <gasps> yeah. Hello, Gazette. 
I'm a member of Squadron 108 in Her Majesty's Angel Corps, and our new airship base is Kendall Town. My squadron leader asked if I would write an article on the past experience of mine in the Force to get the locals of Kendall excited for our imminent arrival. While in Singapore a few years back, my mission was to be a personal bodyguard for a VIP while she attended the opening of the Raffles Hotel. Unfortunately, her identity is classified, but I can still tell you the tale. This lady had travelled with me by her side all the way from Great Britain to cut the ribbon on the opening ceremony of the hotel on December 1st. However, for this event, she was asked to be in Singapore a few weeks prior to the event. As you can imagine, being cooped up in a hotel in an amazing country like Singapore can be pretty dull. The lady wanted nothing more than to see the sights of Singapore, as I would too, so I came up with a plan. We decided we could dress up a female clockwork to look just like her, with one of her dresses and her jewellery, and plant the servant in her room. This meant that the lady could go out for the day and explore the wonderful sights of Singapore, while all the hotel workers and management thought she was spending the day in the garden. Despite it being my personal idea, it was easily one of the riskiest missions I have ever completed. Luckily, no one noticed while we were there, and the lady had a lovely day out. I think one of my squadron leaders may have had an idea of what I did, but I lived to tell the tale. How do you? Welcome to Mutter Downs, the team-up between me and Mike. Hello. After our rather mammoth movie choice <laughs> episode... <laughs> which congratulations if you got to the end i think combined with ian and nikki two and a half hours i think of a uh, comic book movie well, chat in the end <laughs> two and a half hours of quality podcasting yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so today we are talking about marvel versus dc the reason we're talking about it is because first event of the festival really isn't it seven o'clock friday night there is a live drawn debate at the brewery in Kendall uh, where they're bringing together two teams of experts to find out which is truly the comic colossus. Hosted by Emma Vicelli, the teams will slug it out to settle it once and for all. But I know me and my daughter, we've got tickets. So it's the first time we've managed to get into Kendall early enough on a Friday night to go to this opening ceremony. So we're both looking forward to this. I'm hoping to grab some. Because it's not just the debate as well. There's there's a live draw, like you mentioned, and there's going to be uh, the announcement of the next Comics Laureate as well. Um, right. For 2019 to 21. Um, currently, obviously, Charlie Adler. So it uh, be interesting to see. Um, oh, and there's the <coughs> Sergio Aragones International Award for Excellence in Comic Art. And I have no idea if I've said that right. Um, and that's awarded on the night as well. So it's a nice well-rounded at lightning ceremony for the festival yeah brilliant well so we have our list of 12 categories that we're going to debate ourselves obviously the opening ceremony is going to be some of the leading minds and creative talent discussing it and you're going to get us doing it <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> quality may vary <laughs> We're going to um, have a quick discussion about our 12 categories, and I think uh, we're both going to plump for one side and then hopefully tot up the results at the end and see if we can come up with a unanimous winner ourselves. be interesting to see if we, uh, <laughs> if we can yes, win the same, answer. the same one. Yeah. <laughs> we thought it'd be worth starting off with um, personal history. So do you want to give everyone a rundown on what your personal history of, of both companies is? Yeah, sure. I grew up in North Wales, and really, all the main comics that you could find were just Marvel. There were occasional DC comics, um, but they weren't even what you'd think were the iconic ones. Um, they tended to be just the odd issue of Teen Titans, um, which wasn't the best um, anyway from the DC line. Um, but yeah, you couldn't get Batman or Superman or the standard titles. Um, yeah. It was just... But I think, really what made me marvel first would be the fact that i collected star wars comic from the very first issue that's telling you how old i am um uh it was it's still one of my favorite comics ever but it was by marvel and they only filled half of it with star wars stories and the rest of it would be basically random reprints 
Um, right. So it kind of stood around a lot. But what it did do was a lot of the non-earthly Marvel stories. Mm-hmm. So you've got Adam Warlock, Thanos, and um, the Guardians, or Star-Lord anyway. Um, but it did swap about a bit. Um, and I think that just sort of opened up the Marvel world quite well for me. And again, there were just the comics that came out. Marvel tended to do ones that would be in every news agents in sort of magazine format, sort of size, which Star Wars comic was. It wasn't your normal standard comic size. Right. Um, and again, Marvel UK kicked in um, and they did a lot of reprints as well of their own stuff. And again, that was more magazine size format. And that was in all news agents again. So it was really just Marvel because they pushed more stuff on me as a kid more than <laughs> anything else. Uh, that kind of clinched it, really. Um, I don't know why. Um, uh, and I don't know if it was like that for the rest of the country or not. On family holidays, I didn't seem to find much comics again anywhere. So yeah, uh, yeah, I kind of probably formed my Marvel leaning, shall we say? And are you, you still reading more Marvel now, or yeah, so, it's oh, carried on. Yeah, I definitely read a lot more DC, um, but I would actually say I now fill up about half my time reading independent comics. Yeah, easy. So. Out of the two, Marvel is still a lot greater amount of input than, than DC. Yeah, well, I, I think we were probably reading at similar times because it was the same, really, with me in terms of what was available. Marvel had more British weeklies that reprinted their stuff and their actual American comics were available on newsagent shelves. DC Comics, I would find in um, annuals, so we would get, um, you know... I'd get DC Heroes or a Batman annual at Christmas. I might see the odd, say, summer special with some reprints in, but certainly wouldn't see the um, the American versions. That was what led me down to being the Marvel zombie to begin with. When I did start finding the American DCs, you know, certain ones like Legion of Superheroes or Batman, I would lap those up. And then, of course, Teen Titans hit. There was a time I was probably reading equal amounts, sort of Teen Titans, sort of X-Men sort of era. But Marvel was always probably at that slight edge. The New 52 and Marvel Now did make me drop both of them um, to a great extent. I do now read the majority of indie titles and I am much more creator-led in my choice so it's who's writing it who's drawing it that leads me to buy i mean at the moment i am probably reading more dc funnily enough i am reading batman mr miracle doom patrol when it does come out Mm. but at marvel i gave the new avengers a try i gave the new thor a try but they they keep keep restarting and i i I do give them a try but they they generally haven't managed to keep me (laughs) I actually dropped New Avengers myself. Mm. Um, I've kept on with X-Men, absolute yeah. favourite of mine. So that's one of the, and Wolverine as well, um, at least one title at any point. But um, yeah, it's uh, I, I had I'd, I'd forgotten about things like the summer specials and stuff like that. But yeah, it really was. Yeah. It was just Marvel seemed to push more stuff out during those no. sort of inf- yeah. hour informative years sort of thing. Um, it's uh, it's amazing if if something if I drop something from a pull list now, it tends to get replaced by an independent title as well. Yeah, definitely, definitely. There's just so much good stuff coming out from for me. Dark Horse and Image does some great stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna give have to give personal history to Marvel for me. Make mine Marvel. <laughs> so. This is going to be a seriously biased discussion, possibly. <laughs> and possibly I don't not, know. I'm, I, I, yeah, look, looking through, obviously we've not discussed this, all we've given each other is the headings, so oh, I, I think, think it'll, it'll be, be all right. I think we'll be all right. <laughs> right. Take, for instance, the next one. So the next discussion is most iconic heroes. From my point of view, the way I thought about this, it boils down to DC with their trinity. So Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, 
Yeah. They all have, to some degree, a, a great TV pedigree. Certainly, Superman has had multiple TV outings. It's only something I've appreciated later on, was how much Superman was part of the American psyche. Yeah. And you were spot saying about the TV. Yeah. It's never been off TV or radio. Yeah. Ever. Started I, with the movies. You know, well, started with the flashy cartoons, I suppose. I mean, what was that for? Well, yeah, and then it was radio. It's got such a history. Um, and I didn't, I, I didn't realise how much of American psyche that took up. So, I, I mean, I agree. So, I mean, I definitely agree with the Trinity, but Superman has to be the most iconic. Just I think so. the cover of Detective Comics, you know, um, action number one, lifting up the car. It's kind of an iconic image in its own right. I think so. In terms of imagining how many people the world over could recognise Superman, I think the only person from Marvel's side that could probably come close would be Spider-Man. When you then start going down Marvel's you know, heroes, which are, of course, hugely famous and popular now, but I don't think they've still managed to get the outreach and the recognised sort of nature of of those big three. I mean, Batman 66, the TV show, Wonder Woman 70s TV show, all of the merchandise, the fact also that TV was able to be piped into your house. You didn't have to go to the pictures to watch it. You you know, you didn't have to buy a book or, you know, a comic. It, you know, you could switch it on. It was there. You could see, see an advert for it. Uh, perhaps Marvel TV wise started out you know, perhaps a little more juvenile with cartoons and with TV shows that you know later weren't quite the hit of the earlier DC ones. Looking at it from an iconic point of view, I think Spider Man probably beats Captain America. Mm-hmm. I always feel Captain America was what Marvel was trying to use to tap into that same sort of American fervor that they had for Superman. And I don't think it it didn't work to that. It would never get to the level of the love for Superman. But I think Spider Man is truly iconic. The the kids cartoon show I think is a big part of that. And I agree, Batman's definitely up there as well. Definitely part of national conscious. But I can't I can't see anything beating Superman. No. But so I I'm have gonna... to say I think mm. in the future that might be different for people that are growing up with the current Marvel and DC Universe. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I honestly think that Iron Man might actually be, as just the the sensationalism of the first Iron Man movie, mm-hmm. kind of rewrote superhero movies and, oh, right, Marvel are going to do this proper. Um, and, I, and I think that's going to have a big effect. So right now... Definitely Superman. But in the future, I think it's all going to be dictated by the Marvel and DC Cinematic Universe. Yeah, I think you're right with the choice that people have to choose to watch things as opposed to turning on the telly and having a limited choice of channels. And if Superman was on, you'd watch it. If you were a comic fan, you would watch whatever was the most comic related thing. Going forward, if you're a big Marvel movie fan, you can probably just choose to carry on uh, watching Marvel. But like you say, for the moment, I'm going to have to give most iconic hero to to DC. Yeah, <laughs> that's a given. I didn't think that was going to be much, much of a discussion around that. No. Well, maybe it's going to be the same for most iconic villains. Number three. Because I think, given what we just discussed, the one thing that gives DC's villains, again, the edge for being most iconic, was the fact that uh, certainly the Batman TV show of the mid-60s used real comic villains. I mean, okay, there was the odd made-up one with Egghead and such, but the Joker, Penguin, Catwoman, Riddler, they were all there. They all looked pretty much exactly as they did in the comic. It was a family program with something that everybody would watch and certainly everyone was aware of. So maybe Superman with Lex Luthor, Wonder yeah. Woman, funnily enough, again, you know, you get into that kind of villain problem. I think there'd be a lot of people that would be hard pushed naming a Wonder Woman uh, villain, really. I was going to say, I couldn't. It was always just evil humans. 
yeah. rather than a comic or an ability-driven supervillain. I mean, I could certainly probably name a bigger list of Marvel villains than I could DC, but that's because I've read, just read more Marvel so comics. Well. In the same way we judged the most iconic, I just think that um, if you gave a, a sheet of pictures of different Marvel and DC villains to people, <laughs> or it was like, that, it's a question of pointless. Do you know what I mean? was going to, well, I was about to say, the, the acid test for me has been, uh, the, I actually came up with Joker, Penguin, and Lex Luthor. Yeah. Uh, and I basically thought of, uh, rather than pointless, because it's the wrong way around, would it come up and would it be the highest answer in family fortunes? Yes. That's, yeah. that's the true public gauge that yeah. I had in my mind. No, um, I think it's a good, I, it's a good test. I'm not I think, sure that any of the of the Marvel ones would. Even me, when you, you think see, of the most iconic heroes, the villains were never in the TV or the movies no. until much later. I mean, for me, you know, one of the most I- iconic villains ever is Doctor Doom. But yeah. he's just not really been seen outside of comics, apart from a couple of slightly lame movies. But Loki is a very modern, iconic villain. Yeah. He's hit with the kids. You're like a bit low key. Uh, Red Skull, one movie, it doesn't really pull him up. Ultron, I don't know if that name would be there um, on people's it's lips. Controversial, but uh, Magneto. Right, yeah. He is. Yeah. Uh, he's just, unfortunately, in a lot of the X Men series and the films, he's actually yeah. portrayed quite sympathetically. Yes. Uh, but, he, but he's a super villain. <laughs> yeah. No, you're right. Mm hmm. He spent ninety nine percent of his life in, in super villainy, <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think I suppose, that definitely counts. Yeah, I suppose technically, uh, even Deadpool could fit this category in in some instances of his uh, of his career. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think I, Batman sixty six does it for me. I think I'm going to have to give most iconic villains to DC. I'm, I'm going to have to as well. Please. We'll talk that down as a DC then. What's next? Now we're off being, whether it's iconic or not, <laughs> we are going for the best team. Now this is purely where I was. I, I wasn't really using anybody else's knowledge anymore. You know, I, I tried to think, was there a way that each company treated teams differently? Was there something that, you know, or was there a, a kind of team that one universe had that the other hadn't? There is almost certainly equivalence, isn't there? Yes. That's um, what I came to, yeah. So things like the archetypal team I had written down. So JLA and Avengers. Yes. The prime reason those teams are assembled is to put all of your big guns in one comic. Yes. I mean, I'm equating X-Men with Teen Titans. I had that. I had that Teen Titans. Yeah. Well, I, I, I guess we should do these in order, actually. You mentioned Avengers and Justice League. Mm. Um, and we've already both mentioned that we've recently stopped reading new Avengers. <laughs> However, I, I, do, uh, I, I have, over the years, loved the Avengers. Yes. It is something that I've actually followed quite closely. Justice League is probably one of those... Um, it's probably one of those DC titles that I've probably popped in and out of more often than any other DC stuff, mm-hmm. to be fair. Yeah. Uh, so I guess I like the big hitter teams. Like you say, you've got all your favourites all in one. Um, unfortunately, with JLA, there are a couple of my least favourite in there as well. So for consistency, Avengers wins because over the years, all the people who brought in and out... Um, I'm including West Coast Avengers and all the other different splits that they've done. Um, yeah, I, I think Avengers wins for me out of those two. Yes, as you say, I don't think there's there's an era of Avengers that I missed, but there are certainly big cuts of JLA that I haven't read. Okay, you know, um, I don't know, Detroit era. They've got highs like Grant Morrison and Justice League International. And Avengers has probably had lots of spin-offs that I've not read, but ultimately, yeah, I think Avengers, I would definitely choose over the JLA. 
and then I had um, World War Two teams, which I'm a massive Invaders fan, particularly Frank, you know, Frank Robbins did a run on that. Roy Thomas pretty much, I think, wrote most of them, and then when he went over to DC, he wrote a World War Two equivalent, uh, which was the All Star Squadron. Yeah. And, um, I think I need to probably make an apology for the sound quality at this point. Um, just to remind people that as we're recording this, Cumbria is in the middle of a storm. Yes. I don't <laughs> Can you hear that? I just that got rain off. and typhoon <laughs> weather that we've got right uh, now. So apologies. Yeah, it's pretty blowy. I was just trying. To, I was just trying to work out if it was me or not. The DC had Justice Society, uh, which I enjoyed, and they had uh, All Star Squadron, but. You know, nothing could beat the invaders. So, uh, street teams, I was thinking, I love Heroes for Hire. Heroes um, for Hire. Before, sorry. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, as a support team, as a, as a low powered individual. Yeah. Defenders, um, love defenders. I mean, I do, I would probably, and team teams, I think I went for Titans over, uh, New Warriors. Got a lot of time for the Teen Titans. I, I was there from uh, Marv Wolfman, George Perez days. And I do knit back out again with uh, Jeff Johns did a great run when they tie back in with things like Doom Patrol, like they do doing in the TV series. You know, I'm a sucker for that kind of stuff. And then I suppose you, you get to Doom Patrol and X-Men, which perhaps haven't got the similarity they had when they started. But those strange outsider titles started as an outsider title. But certainly X-Men isn't that now, is it? It's definitely top it's super team. I- it is, and it's the core of a lot of spin-offs. The, the number of X series titles, and I pretty much followed a, a, the vast majority of them. And I think it's probably my favourite area of the Marvel Universe. It's one thing that, that's, that's stuck with me. And from the X-Men, as much as I love them, is probably spawned my favourite team, which we're now going into the dark side of things, and that's X-Force. So you get your Psylocke, your, your Deadpool gets in there, Nightcrawler, Wolverine. They're the core members throughout the years. But um, again, it's that slightly grittier, darker mm-hmm. side. But mm-hmm. X-Force, you know, you you do have the more sort of mature themes and everything. Um, I think one of my favourite X-Force storylines, for example, was the, the moral debate around whether they should assassinate a teenage apocalypse before he grows into apocalypse I I think just the collection of characters and the amount of writing talent on on some of those um, X-Force story arcs um, I think think that actually just about beats X-Men even though X-Men has such a huge history for me and a huge volume of work that I've read through Mm -hmm. almost my entire life Funnily enough, I equated X Force with Suicide Squad. I kind of saw comic wise a similar. Yes. Yeah, there is some very good parallels. Yeah. Um, especially because it's not a bonded team. Yeah. It's, it's a bond of convenience. Circumstances. I, I certainly read the earlier uh, run of Suicide Squad, but I, I didn't. I haven't kept up with later iterations. But yeah, I mean, X Men is is something that I have always kept in contact with. Again, usually because of, say, when Matt Fraction or Ed Brubaker was writing it, or uh, Chris Bacalo or something like that was drawing it. But even so, like you say, the cast of characters it's produced is <laughs> just from that one title. It's it's astounding, really. Yeah. Or uncanny. <laughs> <laughs> So I think given given that, I'm going to have to give best team to Marvel. I'm definitely going for X-Men and X-Force, so yeah. we'll, count that as, we'll chalk that up for Marvel. I think Avengers would have swung it for me. Did you notice nobody mentioned the Fantastic Four? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that would, I'd that. probably put that down as family team. I wonder what the equivalent <laughs> in uh, DC to that would have been. Yeah, oh, oh man. One. Oh, that's a huge miss, isn't it? I love the Fantastic Four. But again, even though I loved it so much, it's not something I've, I've, I've read slavishly. But I have to admit, I've only read it, it probably, probably stopped reading that in my teens, so I really don't know how it progressed. Uh, I really I mean, don't. I love the Lee Kirby stuff, but one of the things that pulled me back into comics 
I remember walking through WH Smith and seeing it was a uh, cover to Fantastic Four 237, which is five issues into John Byrne's run in the 80s. And the front cover was five people for a start bursting out of the comic cover. There was a big female human torch. Sue Storm looked quite different. She had short hair. All the costumes were kind of very old school. The Thing was back to his kind of mottled dinosaur hide version. And straight away it was this mix of there was something new and there was something old there. And I was instantly intrigued and I bought that. And from then on, that sort of was how I suppose I was buying the regularly then imported uh, newsstand titles. So that was around the time that, I mean, Miller was still doing Daredevil. So there was an amazing amazing time so I, and i was literally going there i knew when they were delivered and i was buying everything that was there with all of my pocket money which was achievable then when it was like 20 25p for a, for a comic <laughs> they just bypassed me the one thing you could guarantee with fantastic four was there were summer specials and there was annuals yeah and yeah. that was the only access i had to them and they were all reprints I'd yeah. say from the 60s and 70s. Yeah, there was a lot of George I don't Perez know right why. Yeah, yeah um, so I, the, the stuff I read was always so dated. So, again, it's one of those things, if I go back and, you know, ask, you know, what is the best Fantastic Four title to read, I'm sure I'll enjoy it. It could be because it's been up, it would have updated. But even even when I was young, I was reading 10 years previous yeah. worth of material. <laughs> Category number five, stupidest character. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got quite a few to put forward. <laughs> Do you want to start? It's interesting. Is it a win? <laughs> if they've got Is the it a win if you have the most <laughs> or the least stupidest characters? Yeah. <laughs> I suppose you have to. I, to I think they should count against you, I think. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes they're good and they're funny, and sometimes they are just cringeworthy. Um, yeah. And I think I think DC helps you a little bit because when they come up with something rubbish, they kind of know it's rubbish. And one of the telltale signs is I find that they tend to be a naming convention of it's always something lad or something lass, mm-hmm. and it's almost guaranteed to be lame. There's a couple that I've come across, and then there's a couple that I read basically in similar debates online, and I had to look them up. And, the, and there's one I'm still not sure is, is real, but apparently it is. It's got its own Wikipedia page. But uh, just just starting off with the lad and the lasses, infectious lass. <laughs> it's basically typhoid Mary. <laughs> um, I have I have read something with her in. And all, all I could get, all I remember is that she was uh, an alien that was just basically a walking mass of diseases. Yeah. Um, as as bad as that is, there was Colour Kid. Yeah. Uh, and he just seemed to be able to change the colours of things. I think. Again, it's one of these things. He could well be somewhere tucked away in the modern Marvel universe, and they've upgraded his powers. But from an origin point of view. I didn't see the point of them at all. A lot of these, because there was another one called, I think his name was Rock Lad. I think it might have been in a similar story. And he could turn <laughs> into rock, but unfortunately he couldn't move when he turned into rock. <laughs> so he was just completely immobile. And these, they were deliberately invented to be lame because they were uh, they were members of the Legion of Substitute Heroes. I, I was going to mention Remember, this. Yeah. A lot of them. Fetch's last was, and I think Colour Kid was, wasn't he? That's right. Uh, and there was Sarita Lad. That's right. Ate stuff. It did nothing for him. Yeah. Because <laughs> then, I mean, the funny thing is that these were the ones who were the, in the substitute team, uh, and then you had people in the real Legion, like Bouncing Boy, who could turn himself basically yes. into a, a rubber ball. Yeah. I mean, you had some quite strange ones. He made it into the real team. 
But yeah, I, I, I had one, I think there was a team up actually when DC Comics Presents, they had Superman, you know, he would team up with somebody each issue. And one of the issues was Superman and the Legion of Substitute Heroes, which I, I think had uh, one of the early appearances of Ambush Bug. He was, you know, uh, has since become bigger name than he was back then but he was yeah he was this strange sort of teleporting pre-deadpool slightly mischievous slightly murderous in his first appearance uh sort of a super villain who became um just basically a kind of a funny character but yeah i, I do remember infectious like lass in particular in that issue <laughs> i mean this is one of those things though some of these like i said have been retconned since yes. and are quite cool but there's sometimes when they can't get away with it because again, another DC example. It's a, it's a, it's a. Say what you see. Arm fall off, boy. <laughs> yeah. Now this was this was late eighties, I'm sure. Uh, and he just basically basically uses he takes his own <laughs> arm off to beat people with it. Um, <laughs> uh, I I just get the feeling that there was a bit of a I don't know. A spell of heavy drinking in the editorial pool around that time. <laughs> yes. It's difficult, I suppose, sometimes when they do make them up to be lame, but when you make lame ones up as well as that, they and they get then used elsewhere, not in the same knowing way, then, yeah, they just become lame. It does turn up occasionally, doesn't it? Yeah, I think seen so. Too. Mm. Uh, but, but again, I, I, I guess it's with a knowing nod nowadays. When they first appear as well, they do get brought back for the sake, don't they? I remember whenever there's a humour title, like when John Byrne was doing um, She-Hulk, they brought back uh, an old character from one of the, like, the Tales of Suspense sort of monster era called Sprague the Living Hill, who was the, the villain for, for one episode <laughs> of She-Hulk, which was outstandingly lame. Um, and, and I think for me... Some of the stupidest characters that I could recall, and, and I probably haven't spent long enough thinking on this because it's probably a massive area, but villains always tend to fall into this category because you've got to almost come up with more villains than heroes, haven't you? So almost I think sometimes, certainly, yeah. sometimes the, the yeah. villains are lamer. So I remembered Sprague, the Living Kill. There was another character called um, the Living Eraser. Do you remember him? He's an no. old Ant-Man villain who basically could swipe his arms and then bits of the main character would disappear as if they were being rubbed out by a living eraser. <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds almost like something that should be in Deadpool's head yeah. rather than in its actual real in actual real term life. But um, yeah, and no, I've, I've not come across it. <laughs> oh, I tell you, the one more... One of my, one of my favourite lamest villains, and it, it seems so incongruous because of where he appeared as well. There was a villain called Mr. Fish, looked like fish. He was a, basically yeah. a fish man in a suit, and he even kind of had some sort of water gun. And he was the villain in an issue of Luke Cage, Hero for Hire, which I have vague memories of. Yeah, of this. completely incongruous. I, I don't know I why. Have ever read him? I'm pretty sure. <laughs> He's in like a D, he's in like a Marvel um, encyclopedia thing. I'm yeah, say. yeah. So I, 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 as soon as you said that, I pictured basically the fish oh, man. <laughs> I remember buying it because one of the few things I kind of I, I do my d deep dives for in sort of you know back issues now is is picking up Frank Robbins and he did a run on Luke Cage and uh, even though I knew he hadn't drawn this issue, I had to buy that one just because Mister Fish was on the cover. And, they do, Marvel also have some quite crazy heroes like uh, Razorback. Do you remember Razorback? Mm. He was in a few Captain Americas. He's basically a truck driver who dresses like a giant boar. So he's got a big pig's head. Does he still pops up nowadays though, doesn't he? I'm yeah, sure. I him. Yeah. Well, I mean, I they think tend he's... to come in the humour titles, a lot of them now, don't they? They do. They, they do. They, they... They almost make them like the villainous stooges, don't they, a lot of the time. Yeah. They are supposed to be a figure of fun. I mean, the one thing I think, there are more Marvel ones, 
Awesome. But I think Marvel... Well, okay. I was going to say Marvel do have, uh, I think, an ability to make something lane cool again a bit mm-hmm. more. I've got a couple of examples of those. But I guess I, I have to mention, um, and this is one that obviously I'm... <laughs> even I wasn't around to, around to, lead, to read but uh, apparently um, I, I love the history of this one I read uh, in the 40s um, the Human Torch had a villain um, Asbestos Lady <laughs> <laughs> and the reason being was that at the time Asbestos was this fantastic new yeah. product <laughs> and it could do no wrong it was fantastic <laughs> and they were almost doing like a, an advertising section for it uh, using this asbestos lady X-Men had, had a label uh, have, you, have you come across Cypher he has the amazing ability to be able to translate any language that's right he was one of his early new mutants was it Dog somebody didn't he end up linking up with Warlock kind of joined with with the the robot yes, aliens yes, he did. yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 obsolete as soon as google translate was <laughs> the only difference between him and google translate is that he has to actually eat and go to the toilet that's about it um but i think that's that's, that's, that's yeah i suppose that's understandable that's a technology thing I think there's two that are well. There's there's three really. Um, from the from the DC side, um, there is Codpiece, <laughs> who has now actually. Uh, am I correct in saying that he's he, he's he's part of Doom Patrol now? He's in he's in Doom Patrol. Is he? I've never heard of Codpiece. He was, was definitely he in, in Patrol. Like, was it the Grant Morrison era? Was it? Maybe I've just forgotten him. Briar, possibly. Um, he he was in the mainstream universe to begin with, but he really does have a cod piece that oh. can basically turn into a cannon or <laughs> a, a sonic rifle. Um, and there was one, uh, yeah. and I kid you not, it was you know one of those extendable boxing gloves. <laughs> <laughs> and it, yeah. Oh, it, superb. I, I, it was a very special time that DC were having at the time when he came up. But he kind of has had a bit of a makeover. The last, the last I heard of him, like I said, though, I'm, I'm sure he was in a, in a Doom Patrol. Right. Um, thread. That'd been a while ago. I'm gonna have to lock him up. Again, Squirrel Girl <laughs> really annoyed me from Marvel to begin with. Mm. Uh, Steve Ditko creation. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was just so out there. Um, but I remember, um, you know, occasionally, you, used to, uh, you know how they occasionally do like little info pages in between and it'll do like a profile and say what super abilities were. And they tend to do that when something new is introduced. And I remember that <laughs> one of the super abilities at one point was she knows where your nuts are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> apart from. Uh, speaking to squirrels and she has a utility belt which does actually have nut snacks in <laughs> but she is being transformed quite a lot over the last 10 years she's quite a cool character now um, and she attracts some really good writers as well uh, yeah it's a really kind of weird turnaround and again Howard the Duck is probably the last one I have I could not bring myself to call him stupid, but I know, I know why he's been brought up. The surrounding cast that he had, again, some of the villains. It's worth mentioning Dr. Bong. <laughs> yes. Uh, Hell Cow. Oh, my, yeah. My personal favourite, the Space Turnip. I take it that's a turnip from outer space. Well, it's a guy dressed as a turnip from outer space, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Which is I, the only thing that could make that better. <laughs> he came to mind as a stupid character because when he made appearances, I didn't get it and I just thought it was just so incongruous with everything else that was going on. I didn't really know at that uh, when I was younger what the, the actual the origins of how the duck mm. and it was really there was it was quite political wasn't it a lot of the 
the barbs that he made. It was all very American politics back then. Yeah, uh, yeah, he ran for president. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, and I, I just, I guess as a kid, I didn't get that. And then it kind of annoyed me a little bit um, as I was sort of like growing and my comic life was evolving. And then I kind of understood where he came from. Uh, and what it was and uh, w- what he was doing in the universe and the fact that he can be a bit sort of like fourth wallish but yeah uh, yeah yeah so now no i wouldn't count him as stupid but i think <laughs> it's one of those that's super rare. and the fact that they're trying that i mean he's made an appearance in the marvel cinematic universe mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so i think marvel have kind of made amends on some of those rather mad characters to begin with anyway well again I can only go by what what I've read, but when Marvel do sort of bring back things like Sprague, the Living Hill, they don't tend to try and reinvent them, and a lot of times will just embrace their stupidity, which yeah. is, and I think there's a little bit of that with DC. I mean, most of my list was Marvel, particularly the Marvel um, villains, so I think I'm going to have to plump for Marvel for stupidest character for me. But um, I'm sure there's equal on both sides. But for the sake of this, I think I'll go Marvel. So if I choose Marvel, does that mean DC get the point? Is that right? Yeah, but I'm going to choose DC. So it's cancelled each other out. Yeah. <laughs> Arm fall off, boy. Um, infectious lass. And I forgot to mention the fiddler. And every time yeah. I see the fiddler, you just want to put the word kiddie in front of that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, when you actually look at the character as well. Uh, but, yeah, to hypnotise somebody just having to play the violin is just so impractical. I'm keeping track. I've got that as a, as a drawer as we chose differently. OK, so category six, best costume. Yeah, I, I kind of approach this again more really about what's my favourite uh-huh. that I see. But I had another think as well. Just when you go to comic conventions, there are some really popular cosplay ones. And I don't know whether that is a mix of they're they're easy to do ones. (laughs) They are. (laughs) There may be a bit of that. Or those are the not iconic because we've we've done iconic and I think that kind of included costume a little bit as well. But yeah, I, I or are they truly the favourite of the of the public? I mean, Deadpool is is one who you see a lot of cons. But from what <laughs> yeah. I remember reading, apparently Deadpool's costume came about because Rob Liefeld designed a character that had echoes of Spider-Man. I think in terms of you know the mask and maybe other costume elements, but purposely kept the details a lot of sparser so that he had a much quicker time drawing them. Or drawing this character, and that's why uh, Deadpool's costume looks the way it does. There, there is also more to that story, actually. Oh yeah, Deadpool, Deadpool, the costume and the, the and the niche and the power set, should we say? Yeah, is a complete ripoff of Deathstroke. Yes, uh, it can you be the name. Called Wade Wilson, yeah. <laughs> and I have to say, actually. Uh, I absolutely love the costume. I do like them. Mm. And they do look... The colour is uh, obviously very different, but um, as a concept, um, yeah, I do actually love that costume. And you, like you said, you do see an awful lot of them around Mm. uh, uh, cosplaying. But again, I think it might just be one of those that's quite easily available now. Um, I think, yeah. I, I, I haven't taken into account popularity or, you know, what other people are wearing so much in mind as being the most striking, I suppose, or perhaps most... Well, I think for me there's two things about a good costume. That it's strikingly original and you don't see many costumes like it. And then there's the, it's so appropriate for that character that it's brilliant in its mesh of of design sense in that way. Because the very first thing I had written down, actually, was both original Captain Marvels. So the DC Captain Marvel, now called Shazam, and the, well, it would have been the second, I suppose, not the original Marvel Captain Marvel with the white and green, but that 
very sleek blue, gold and red. I think it was probably drawn by Gil Kane maybe first when he had sort of white hair. Captain Marvel had white hair. But that to me, it's, it's a kind of fundamental sort of superhero costume that it seems quintessential superhero to me. And the DC Shazam Captain Marvel is just wonderfully not old school, but of its time, to the extent that that little um, kind of... It's not a matador cape, is it? I don't know what... It's kind of Napoleonic almost, isn't it? With the fact that it's on one side, it's got the rope there, going under the big... There's going to be a very technical term for it. I know yeah, it is. But I, I don't know <laughs> but it. No, I don't know it. But also the fact that, if not the original Captain Marvel, but certainly uh, Captain Marvel Jr. influenced Elvis in his stage um, costume. The jumpsuit... Wow. The jumpsuit, I've never heard that connection. Yeah, the jumpsuit, the cape, and the hair. Apparently, uh, uh, Captain Marvel Jr. and I think, oh, the guy's name, I think Raboy was his surname, but he was drawing probably Captain Marvel uh, Jr. in particular, and I think he gave him quite a little, a bit more of a bouffant sort of hairstyle and perhaps um, some uh, sideburns. But I love the fact that, you know, that comic costume influence leaving comics and then influencing other pop culture icons. So um, both of those and also stunning in its kind of originality and how well it stands out is Black Bolt. Jack yeah. Kirby's Black Bolt costume. I just find, you know, fantastic. And I, I really resent when people try and update it or change it. I don't think you should do a single thing to it. I think it's brilliant in it, its sleekness and its uh, its design sense. Love it. When you were talking about a costume that, that really does sum up the person, as a piece of design work, I really rate Spider-Man yeah. right from the very beginning. I know it's yeah. been updated and sleeker and... Um, and I've always loved the design. Um, and again, when Venom came along, and then Spider Gwen, I, I think it's just a masterpiece of uh, of technical design. I think they're so so striking. Um, but Spider Man's just always been there, and it's just always been striking, no matter what era and no matter what era you look back to as a sort of a unique thing. Um, it's been copied by minor superheroes on both sides of Marvel and DC occasionally. Um, but I think that's that's probably going to have to rank up there for me. Yeah, um, I had that on my list as well. I had Spider-Man down. Yeah, on, on sort of like a not never looking dated Wolverine as well is another mm -hmm. one just the stylistic value of it, um, even with the big, with the boots, with the big pointy kneecaps, and the the huge uh, back flowing mask as yeah. well. Uh, I just, I, I think, I think it gave the artist something to really play with, and his suit looked dynamic when he was standing still. Yeah, uh, and again, it was just sums him up um, again it's another one where they've they've made it slicker and cooler as we've you know gone through the years but even the original wolverine i just absolutely love i love the mask i have to say i do have a slight problem with the yellow the yellow and the blue I, i'd liked his brown costume that kind of more simpler it seemed a little more closer to that kind of animalistic already wore fangs yeah. costume in the early days so I would be giving my best costume, even though I've given a shout out to old Shazam, I think I would give it to Marvel. Spider-Man for me. So yeah, another one for Marvel. I've got to mention as well, because this is probably going to sound a bit weird, but um, <laughs> I kind of like the old yellow blouse would be the only way to describe it, of Luke Cage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Again, I think it looks very dated now but i remember back at the time that was so cool <laughs> uh, it was basically due to the yellow blouse um and i can't really explain it it's just one of those things you, you read something growing up and it's <laughs> with the tiara 
And the tiara. The tiara, yeah. Oh, man. So Marvel is chalked up for the win for best costume. Now, what number are we on now? The next category is most powerful. Is that number seven? Yes. We've both got problems with this, haven't we? I was I was thinking that this is going to start off with somebody saying something powerful and then somebody having to come up with who would beat that person. But I think we can escalate this quite quickly. I slightly worry about my knowledge gap because um, I certainly am more aware of the Marvel cosmic entities that we would eventually end up at, aren't we? We're, we're talking about, what, Eternity, Celestials, yeah, or In Between Earth, Stalin, I mean, anything in the Stalin run. Or if you take out cosmic entities, are we talking about Galactus versus um, Dark Side? I, I always equate uh, equate with with Apocalypse more, but yeah, you got Galactus, you've got again, you can't say Superman because you've got Superman Prime. Um, <laughs> Phoenix Force is a again, but I just kept escalating this right, and I've got a huge list of like scrolling down. <laughs> And I was kind of like thinking, well, my final thoughts were, oh, hey, Infinity Gauntlet, Thanos can change reality. And I really thought, whilst I was trying to scribble down as much things as possible, that that kind of is everything. That's got to top everything. Then I remembered Dr. Manhattan, Mm -hmm. who can just do anything. He can blink molecules, realities, dimensions, in or out of existence. There's, I can't, I can't see anything topping Dr. Manhattan. The Molecule Man was key in Secret Wars, wasn't he? He was involved towards the end. He had similar shaping powers, didn't he? The Molecule Man seemed to be almost an equivalent. I've Um, always had the feeling that DC generally has a higher power set than Marvel. They... I think I mentioned before we started recording, I had a DC question for you, which I was hoping, because, again, with a similar discussion that was being had, DC has one above all, Elaine okay. Bella. And, again, it's not a character I'm actually familiar with, but um, apparently my, my understanding is it's just a supreme being. So, what, what was the name again? Elaine Bella, one above all. Elaine Bella. And where, what's the history? Where, what was the appearance? No idea. It was purely from an internet discussion <laughs> late at night. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, the, the person or persons uh, <laughs> that was replying was basically using it as a, as a full stop to every argument that was going on. Um, so it's just one I'm not aware of. But again, yeah. I, I just cannot see. Oh, I apologies. Sorry, I'm just googling as we speak now. One above all is Marvel. Presence is the DC equivalent. But it's again, it's omnipotence. So how well, do we treat the subject if we can get, get to omnipotence? To be honest, thinking thinking outside the box somewhat, we can draw the conclusion that. Grant Morrison has in a couple of his series, so Multiversity and I think Seven Soldiers, hinted at a force beyond the DC Universe, which is the actual editors at DC, so that the the physical presence from our world, which is governing the, the comic universe. So maybe you could argue that the DC Universe as the ultimately most powerful characters because their universe has recognised they are, in essence, a fictional entity. So maybe... That sounds a bit too convoluted to me. I'll go with it. <laughs> DC for the win? <laughs> I was just trying to think, what's that... Um, uh, what's that scientific theory that we are all living inside? A hologram. Yeah, that we're living inside um, an actual program. Yeah. So, I mean, that's almost the DC equivalent, really, is that the DC universe has realised that they are actually uh, a kind of program being run by outside instances. So, um, 
I, I don't know of any instance where Marvel has recognised that outside influence in the same way. So I'm happy with <laughs> that's physical. I'm happy with DC for the win on that one. Okay, I'll put DC down for that. <laughs> Most respected collection or series. Now, I think this came up in our last uh, discussion on comic book movies. Yeah. When the top titles, those much uh, sort of vaunted comic tomes that people are, uh, are told are, are the best examples of, of the industry, it's usually uh, Watchmen, Dark Knight Returns, Sandman, and I think we, you know, we briefly asked last episode, are there any equivalents in Marvel to challenge these these top three? I mean, they're not universally regarded. You can always find somebody online who refutes the greatness of each. So it's all subjective, but you can pretty much guarantee that they are always going to be in a, in a list of... Uh, they are the same ones that I collected for DC. Yeah, and, it, and I agree they're almost universal. Apart from Batman, Dark Knight, that's not that's quite commonly substituted either by Killing Joke or Arkham Asylum. Yeah, but Watchmen, Sandman, yeah, all there. That's the kind of company that we're trying to find something from Marvel to match. I think certainly that kind of self-reflective element that Watchmen and, and, and Sandman has. It's wanting to be seen to be literary works. I know the creators of Watchmen are probably a little perturbed that it had the effect on the industry that it did, because in pe instead of yeah. people seeing something in the storytelling or in the the makeup of, of how they built the story or characters, it was essentially seen that Grim and gritty is the way. Now, whether that was in combination with Dark Knight, but it certainly sent comics, or some would claim, sent comics down a, a grim alleyway for for a fair few years. It's they're not dissimilar eras, are they? You got Watchmen and Sandman. Sandman. No, they're all yeah. I mean, you they're can all of a, of a similar era. Um, yeah, and again, the part, Batman. Part of the um, British invasion, wasn't it? I mean, Swamp Thing sometimes gets. <laughs> well, yes. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? And it was a turn to the dark side. Did you have any? I got. I had Marvels. Do you remember Marvels? The Kurt uh, Busiek. It was a prestige four issue miniseries, early nineties, painted by Alex Ross. But it was the photo journalist who was who was taking the shots from the point of view of the people on the street, so that you were kind of seeing the Marvel universe in a more majestic sense there's a very iconic shot of giant man being taken instead of you being seeing them from the same point of view of the other heroes as they were all in the same club you were actually uh, a person in the street so you were having to put up with you know attacks from galactus or bank robberies and yeah. do you remember that i don't actually yeah that was the only one i could think of that was well regarded you know, it's it's an interesting read. It makes you look at the Marvel Universe in a, a, a different way. But uh, from what I remember, there wasn't a lot of story there. There was some in, intriguing characters introduced, but it, it allowed you to view the various runs or storylines or famous incidents that happened from a different point of view. So rather than being a different story like Watchmen, Dark Knight Returns or Sandman, it was a re-examination of all of those things that made Marvel great. So the Lee and Kirby FF years or, you know, uh, the early Spider-Man runs, the various creations of, of the characters, Captain America coming back in the 60s and the Avengers forming, uh, the Hulk being created. So I think that is what Marvel are remembered for and what collections people love to read are the collections of the the stories that they remember reading. I've got written down Lee and Kirby's FF, Steranko's Nick Fury, Stalin's 70s Warlock run, and frivolous, but I love it, 80s Kazar. <laughs> 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 but so, yeah, so the answer is 
are they the equivalent? I mean, I suppose that's what the debate is. I mean, when I looked at Marvel, um, I, I, there, was, there was two paths I took. The first was, what are the big story arcs or collected works that I enjoyed the most and I think changed something? I think, I think Secret Wars was great and there's been lots of Secret Wars since as a concept, but it didn't change anything. Mm. Um, Age of Apocalypse, okay, being done a few times now in different formats, again, didn't change anything. But I think Civil War really did change. It was a bit of a step change, I think, in the Marvel story. Mm -hmm. And it really was, it's not the first time, obviously, heroes have been pitted against each other, but there was a proper moral argument in it. And I think that's been quite well respected yeah. um, and is lauded as one of the better. Um, and I think in a similar vein of world changing, universe changing, House of M oh, was okay. a big impact. Yeah. These are, relatively speaking, modern-ish. Mm -hmm. Well, they're, they're all modern. You know, there's, 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 there's no sort of going back to Silver Age on these. But when I look at it from a sort of an academic point of view, and DC, again, you know, from an academic point of view, Sandman and Watchmen, Watchmen in particular, is kind of sort of regarded in an academic view mm -hmm. and torn to pieces in dissertations. The one academic sort of Marvel storyline, I think, has to be the night Gwen Stacy died. Mm. And I think that was a phenomenal change um, in the course of comics. Again, it's one of, <laughs> it, it, it's one of these things that uh, I have to go back and understand more um, because it's, well, before my reading time. But to actually have a character sort of lose his girlfriend mm. in that way. Um, and I, it, it wasn't bringing in the dark like the Watchmen or, or yeah. Batman Dark Knight did. It was bringing in grit yeah. and a sense of reality. Um, and I think that's, Drama. A, that's, yeah. that's a big thing. And to be honest, uh, when it comes to comparing against the DC and how, how respected the, the series we've been saying yeah. are, the night when Stacy died is probably the only example I would put forward from Marvel. Mm. I love House of M, it would be close for me. But, yeah. But I, 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 I think, for me, I think yeah. I have to admit it to DC, really. Yes, yeah, same with me, and especially I think when uh, I extended it beyond those top three, so things like Frank Miller's Run in, and also Vertigo, which yeah. Marvel hasn't got a kind of equivalent arm of their publishing where they did try genres or try things um, in in a more mature way. And when they did yeah. try it, it was more in a kind of gratuitous sense, I think. Um, so, yes, I'll, I'll, I'm, I think I'm giving that to DC myself. DC wins. Comic continuity. Now, I think uh, we had a brief chat, didn't we, to make sure we we're on the same page in this. And this is really... I don't suppose maybe there are um, non-comic readers care about canon or know how many times things are argued about whether it's something actually happened or not. But essentially, continuity is that sense of connectedness, isn't there, in a, in a universe which um, started in, well, I'm sure there are earlier versions, I suppose, uh, Justice Society, I think, was one of them where they uh the team came together even though the characters individual adventures happened that there was this sense of a team so that they were all happening in the same universe but flash gets mentioned a lot the original flash um existing in a parallel universe to the earth one version dc 
I suppose was was the first there with it. Marvel's certainly known for it. It's, it's brought it um, into the cinematic universe in a in a very successful way. For me, I I suppose I look at what is current. Well, it's not just what's currently happening, but DC, even though they might have stops and starts, they've they started with their original continuity right up until um, Crisis on Infinite Earths, which is where the first big shift happened. And we've gone, we've lurched from crisis to crisis and change to change through Flashpoint, New 52, Rebirth. Now we're getting, you know, we're finding out that Rebirth is kind of taking us back to some points of that original pre-Flashpoint um, continuity. So they do always dance along the same line, it seems, of, of even though they might restart and go back. Um, Marvel tends to take a different approach where they just kind of slide. and They don't really make issue or declare where they are but suddenly you read a story and Tony Stark um, didn't get injured in the Korean War he got injured yes. in Afghanistan or yeah. Reed and Ben didn't serve together in World War Two you know they, yeah. they might not have served together at all like I can't remember where they are now but Marvel just tends to take that approach of we'll just fix everything and just fudge it so that pretty much we always know that the key point of this sort of happening is a relatively similar event in more recent times yes there's always just the modern equivalence yeah in it so i suppose it's really down to which which you prefer how how do you prefer your comic continuity do you do you like the the constant um, back reference? Do you like the, the the actual tortured pains sometimes that writers go to to make sure that something that you know happened in the past is still regarded as happening? So uh, I suppose that's the question. For me, with Marvel, um, I agree with you completely. It's a it's a, it's it's a slow evolution, but it's there, and then it's taken for granted once it's in. Mm -hmm. There's no big wall they hit, and there's there's no there's not really reboots. When they did something like they created the Ultimates universe, I didn't get on with that. It wasn't, but it, its intended audience was not me. It was to attract new people in, but it was a separate universe and it went off on a parallel track. Mm -hmm. And it was very obvious from the titles, so you understood what was going on. But in a similar way of Marvel Zombies. <laughs> that's on, <laughs> that, that's, you know, got its own, um, it is in its own sort of um, version. Yeah. Uh, obviously, with all the different, they, they, they both have their own equivalents don't they uh, of the multiverses mm -hmm. and even their numbering system to be honest I think what what kind of clashed with me a little bit with DC was I was trying at one point to become more of a DC fan mm -hmm. um, and they did I think it was bad timing Jumping in at sort of like Crisis on Infinite Earth was probably quite a good time. It kind of gelled things together that I knew, kind of started rewriting stuff. Uh, and then, like you said, it was jumping from crisis to crisis. And then the new 52 kind of screwed me a bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have to say, it, it was a family issue. My <laughs> my, but my sister was uh, furious about some of the um, changes that came with the with the new fifty two. Yeah, she's a big comic fan as well. Um, and again, uh, I, I think since Rebirth, yeah, I'm getting it um, and I'm liking it. But I think there is too many jarring events over the years that's kind of made it a little bit hard. Whereas at least with Marvel, I know I've read a lot, so I've got more history, but they haven't had huge kickstarts 
of rebooting this, that and the other to such a degree where you you feel like you're displaced in any way. I suppose it's it's where it ends up, isn't it, for both of them? Like currently, they've both pretty much backtracked to a certain extent on some of the things they've done. Um, DC's backtracking on the the new Fifty Two. Uh, Marvel is backtracking on some of the Marvel Now stuff they've done. So Captain yeah. America uh, and a lot of the heroes are returning to their roots. I suppose in the back of your mind you always feel it is always going to end up at some kind of equity or equilibrium. It's much like when somebody dies, do you really believe they're going to stay dead? So do you really believe the universe will ultimately stay changed? Um, I I can't blame them for trying to find a a different readership, um, but them trying to find that for a while did alienate me, and perhaps in some characters still, still does. But I suppose I do like the, 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 the way that DC tend to work really hard at keeping some aspects and perhaps even some of the sillier sides of what they do alive. I mentioned before we started recording about Grant Morrison and his Batman run, how he brought in some aspects of um, some very silly elements from Batman's past and makes, you know, very passable uh, reasons for them existing. So I think I'd have to lump the DC. Maybe it's because they're, they've been going longer and they're sticking to their guns on certain uh, continuity points. Uh, funnily enough, I, I had a think about um, <laughs> what you just said, actually, about um, is somebody dead or not? <laughs> I think I, I think Marvel has to has to be acknowledged as bringing people back from the dead far more than DC do, which I think is a bit of a cheat. Um, sometimes, obviously, if you're gunning for, you know, if you, yeah, sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing if it wasn't somebody you were bothered about. But then actually, I thought, well, actually, if you think of things like House of M. They stick to their guns sometimes, and a lot of people do stay dead or depowered. Mm-hmm. And then I suddenly thought, yeah, I think just Marvel just tends to kill people more often. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I ignored that thinking. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm going to have to say Marvel. Uh, I think it's had less, less jarring um, reshuffles. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. For me. Yeah. Um, and I, I appreciate that DC do some very clever rewriting sometimes, but sometimes they almost write themselves into a corner. Um, and I think I think I prefer Marvel's smooth waters approach. So yeah, okay. So we'll agree to uh, disagree on that one. So we'll chill that down to a draw, which I'm kind of happy about because I don't think there's a right or a wrong. Yeah, I, I just know. think it's fundam- It's one of the few areas where they truly differ, and yeah. they don't reflect each other. Yeah, is their That's approach a to that. way to okay. handle it? Which are, yeah, both are absolutely fine. Yeah. Okay, narrowing down to the end, we have category ten: movie adaptions. Now, are we doing movies, TV series, animations, all in one? Uh, I'll have to read. Th- I've got I've got them separate. For me, obviously, after last issue, uh, last episode, it's going to be Marvel for movie adaptations. I didn't have a single DC in my um, movies. Oh, um, no, didn't did you? <laughs> no. So and my choice of Suicide Squad was very. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. didn't go down well. I did say it was style over substance. <laughs> oh, there's. No, that's, that's the joy of these listings, isn't it? You, it's, yeah. it's part you want people to disagree as well. OK, well, I'll tell you what, let's, if we do all three, I mean, I, for movies, I had Marvel just because I, I, you know, I kind of did my reasons last issue. But TV, I was watching a lot of the new CW stuff. I was watching Arrow, Flash, Supergirl, Legends of Tomorrow with my kids. But 24, 26 episodes of Arrow and the Flash is just too much. 
that you get to those episodes where they're just you know filler you don't feel like the the, the pressure of making a tv show and this many episodes shows so i'm not watching the, the cw stuff anymore i'm not watching any dc shows but i am still watching the netflix shows and legion which i'm a bit behind on legion but yeah, i just too, actually. Love it. i love I'll it but finish this last one but the fact that they've got a manageable episode count, I do have problems with some of these Netflix shows seeming to spin the wheels a little bit. Um, I don't like all of them as much as each other. I have huge problems with Iron Fist, but uh, Daredevil Season 1 is still uh, the best as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Punisher and Elements of Luke Cage I enjoyed. So I gave um, TV to Marvel. And then animated, I do like a good cartoon. Again, watched a lot of these with the girls before the movies or just at the start of the movies. Marvel had some great TV uh, cartoons. We had, um, there was an Avengers cartoon, Earth's Mightiest Heroes, I think, that was fantastic. Uh, Ultimate Spider-Man uh, with uh, Man of Action's involvement. And then going, you know, going back in the past, 60s Spider-Man. But... As soon as you take into account Batman, the animated series, and a personal family favourite, Batman, the Brave and the Bold, and then you've got Teen Titans, Young Justice, Justice League Unlimited, even some of the animated features like uh, The New Frontier, Teen Titans Go, I gave animated to DC. So I realise you, I think, did all in one. Well, if you want, we could do, we could do them properly separate then. Movie, TV, animated. Okay, so that's easy enough to split up for me. Yeah, there you go. Well, I've I've given you mine now, so you might as well just. Um, I I agree for different reasons though. Oh really? <laughs> it's going to be Marvel, Marvel, DC. Yeah. Ah, uh, that's cool. Okay. Let's let's hear the reasons. <laughs> <laughs> uh, base, basically on the movies. I think that Marvel had a clearer idea from the very beginning where they were going. Mm -hmm. They're announcing their movies so far in advance, just the whole Hollywood system of them doing it. I think Disney massively helped them. Um, and I think just the box office speaks volumes. Mm -hmm. um, again, the way... The, the Marvel films are in conjunction with the TV series. That's I don't I don't I, am I correct in saying the DC isn't? They have different actors. Ye yeah. It that's jarring to me. So I see it as a split of the DC cinematic universe to the DC. TV okay. universe almost, whereas Marvel feels like one. Well, just watching Agents of Shield, all the major events have effects within that series. Yeah. And um, you've had guest stars, you like Sif as well? She appeared in. Yeah. Agents of Shield. Yeah. Oh, there's 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 been lots through Agents of Shield. I think that's I think that's really quite cool. I mean, with the Marvel films though, the way that they structured them as well. So that you have their own individual, uh, a hero's individual film, maybe a sequel, and then uh, at the same time as doing the team up. So you have, you know, Iron Man, Captain America. Um, the, it was just better thought out. I mean, you can tell that it was planned from the very start. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they chose to introduce people in the right order as well. Um, so, um, am I correct in saying it would be Iron Man, Captain America, Thor, for the first three? Yes, I always get... I, I think that is, isn't it? Um, I get mixed up the order of Cap and... But doesn't Cap end with the hammer? I think that's the way I remember it. <laughs> yes, Cap, of course. Cap ends with yeah, the yes. hammer, so it leads into yeah. Thor, and then that's right, and then Thor leads in. And again, after the trailers, you have the teaser for the next film. Mm -hmm. And how it's gone from the Avengers, 
and then you've brought in Guardians of the Galaxy, and then they bring in the Infinity Gauntlet's arc. It's uh, I, I just ten year old me can't believe his look uh, <laughs> is the only way I can put it. Um, the DC stuff I am enjoying actually, but it's not as connected up, um, and it doesn't feel as planned to me anyway. Um, so it, it has to be Marvel for the movies. Yeah. Uh, and again, when we go on to the, the TV series, it's just that. The TV series, especially the Netflix um, stuff and the way that that interweaves, um, just again, superb planning. Um, I still, uh, I'm, I'm working my way through it. I haven't got to Iron Fist yeah. or The Defenders <laughs> yet. Um, but again, even some of the series take the punishers quite different. Mm-hmm. That is slow to begin with. Mm-hmm. Slow, slow, faster, faster. Oh my god, I can't believe you just did that. <laughs> uh, but even if it's slow at the beginning, you still carry on watching. And unfortunately, I gave up on quite a few DC series, and it really did feel feel like the budget wasn't there in parts. Yeah. Um, Legends of Tomorrow. Yeah. I really enjoyed that to begin with, and it lost its way big time for me. And it's the only time I'm normally quite. <laughs> I'm quite OCD about I start a series I'll watch it to the end just to check <laughs> even if I'm thinking it's lousy I have to know that it was yeah. lousy so I can walk away confidently and again it's only it's one of those where I've actually watched a season and a half and walked away from it yeah. so again that's why Marvel I think just does better cinematically um, outside of comics when we're talking about the animations, I, I was trying to... I can't come up with anything that I actually... Right, I've, I've watched quite a few of the Marvel ones, and um, there was the sort of uh, one that was basically doing Planet Hulk, wasn't it? Um, and then there yeah. was... was a the Avengers there was a, Mar- was, there was, a, there was a Hulk versus as well. Did you see that Hulk versus Wolverine, Hulk versus... Around the same time as the Planet Hulk feature... There was one called Hulk versus, and there was Hulk versus oh, Thor and Hulk no. versus Wolf. That was quite good. Um, I watched some of the Avengers stuff. There was yeah. uh, there was a Shield one as well. Um, they were okay. Mm. Um, the animation style okay, except for today. Um, but I just think DC takes it to another level, and I'm not just talking about artwork, but I'm talking about plots as well. Yeah, but for Batman. The Batman is so such a stylized art style. I loved that. I thought it was really well done. A lot of the Batman ones. Um, and I, I just think, in the same way I feel Marvel is years ahead on films and TV, I think DC is just years ahead on, on animation. I think it helps being uh, owned by Warner Brothers in that sense. You, you'd think being owned by Warner Brothers would affect their cinema offerings more but the certainly, I think it shows through on the on the animation side, the fact that you have got this renowned animation studio that's enabled industry changing um, animations to come really from the DC universe. Although you have to remember, Marvel has Disney. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I think that's an even bigger win for DC. Yes, uh, in well, I mean, maybe it'll start showing. <laughs> yeah. So I guess we've both gone Marvel, Marvel, DC. Yes. So I'm guessing that's 42. Have you been keeping track as we've gone? Or I do we, do we need a drum roll? I can't do a drum roll. Why did I just say that? <laughs> I will have them into... You know, we've been pretty even all the way through. You're not going to believe this. (laughs) It's a complete draw. (laughs) Brilliant. I did think that when we went through the beginning and we had 12. I thought, hmm, is that going to be a problem? Well... I don't mind that, to be honest. And I think it's probably something that they won't end up with at the actual uh, opening ceremony, because I know in previous years they've had equally difficult tasks and they have taken upon themselves 
to get a definitive answer. Answer. So, <laughs> but I don't mind. I think we've done very well to discuss, and uh, and they were honest debates and discussions. So, um, yeah, um, I think that's I think that's quite appropriate. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy with that. Yeah, <laughs> I think yeah. that match really as well. Brilliant. Well, I do hope you can make the opening ceremony, Mike. That'll be uh, that'll be fab. I do. Uh, I, to be fair, I only just realised when you read it out earlier that it was at the brewery. I had an idea that it was at the college, but I think that might have been a previous year. So, oh, right. um, oh, it'd be nice. I, I can easily drive myself up and park somewhere. So, uh, if if only just to to see you guys. Uh, but it's nice, like you said, to have the the podcast team together. Yeah, no, it'll be fab. I'm really looking forward to it. I mean, Daisy's really excited as well because it's her first year. I think we might have actually recorded longer than the opening ceremony that um, will <laughs> the last itself. I think we've, got, we've got yet another uh, thank you to any listener that's made it to the end of, uh, of, of this another Mammoth recording session. And I hope we return when the podcast does after the... Um, after the festival itself, and that um, Ian hasn't got another couple who talk less. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and I guess I need to buy my ticket before this goes out, just in case it encourages any more people to turn up at the opening <laughs> events. It's been so successful. <laughs> yeah. We've got to we've got to chew through all this first. Brilliant. Uh, oh well, uh, if you are out there, thank you, listener, and. Uh, We will be yakking in your ear very soon. Cheers. Cheers. Need a podcast all about comics topics, reviews, and just general chit-chat? Then join David Robertson, Fernando Pons, Mike Sadakat, Giuseppe Lambertino, and me, Tom Stewart, at That Comic Smell. You can find us on SoundCloud, YouTube, and iTunes. And on Twitter and Instagram at That Comic Smell. Pull up a chair and join us. There you go, you made it to the other side. And let's talk a bit about the festival. Mere weeks away. I was going to say something there, but then I thought, I don't know what to say. Apart well from, done. Yes. First things first, the art window art trail has started going up in Gendal, and you have got <laughs> yours up. Twice. Uh, yes. What's yeah, been it, twice? Dear? It fell down. <laughs> It lasted an hour and a half before I had a frantic phone call. Um, <laughs> so it's up in Cafe Olive. It is up in Cafe Olive. And you put Pete's up as well. I put Pete's up. His fell down too. Which is in... <laughs> Waterside Cafe. Waterside Cafe. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't going to tell me it would fallen down there to we walked past it no. last night. It wasn't how I hung it. Yeah, <laughs> it fell down. <laughs> it fell down. But it's up now. It's back up again. Do you know, it's... It is hard actually getting them to stay up in cafes and things and places because both mine and Pete's are by an open door. So you've got the temperature changes. You've got people coming in and out. Mm-hmm. So you're causing like a draft each time. So you think, and I thought I'd got it up there. All right. And you think you've got them there and then no, no, no they just decide that they're not sticking. So there's enough white tack. In fact, the window moved slightly when I was pressing because I was pressing so hard. Mm-hmm. I'm quite pleased I didn't take their entire window out. That would have been. Yeah. Embarrassing. <laughs> Might damage you out as well. <laughs> Can't have that. <laughs> no, my art would have been fine. <laughs> so, seriously, if you, you are around Kendall, go and check out Yeah. the uh, Windows Trail. Yes, quite a few are going up. Yeah. Um, I saw eight or nine of them yesterday. Mm-hmm. So, they That's should be right. up this following this week, shouldn't they? So, we'll be around the whole weekend. Uh, on Saturday afternoon, we're going to be in the Shakespeare Centre, the Scottish Brophy. I'm going in there. Yeah. Because I sound Scottish. Mm. Hey, the new. Oh, hey, the new. Yeah. Um, yes. So you'll be selling Anxiety Me there? I will For be. half a day? For half a day. Half a day? Well, because yes. we're too busy doing we're other stuff. We're very busy. We can't linger. No, no. <laughs> um, we've got our timetable, what we're doing for the weekend sorted. Mm-hmm. It's too much, too much to see. I know. Uh, but yeah, so we'll be about, if you see us, come and say hello. Yeah. Please do. We'll be in the clock tower, I reckon, quite we'll be a lot. In the clock tower and probably majority will be everywhere. I'm going to get my face painted because I want my face painted. I want to be a fairy or a butterfly. I think, really, you want to be something, you know. What? Comic related. Unicorn. She-Ra. I could be Rainbow Bright. Jesus. Done. 
Comic related. Yeah, there's a new comic of Rainbow Bright Spider Owl. Spider Gwen. Don't you know anything? Are you going to Spider Gwen? I'll go with Spider Gwen. <laughs> um, Saturday night will be in all of the places. All of the... <laughs> we will be everywhere again. <laughs> uh, one Man Band, obviously, will be going to see yep. Yoms and Corey's Clockwork Watch. Parade. Parade, and then Trinkies and Band. Yep. And then there's a good chance I will be doing stand-up at Ruskin's <laughs> from 10 o'clock onwards for five so minutes. I'll be providing the tomatoes to throw at him. Thank you. So if you're, you're out on the Saturday night, make sure you don't come and see me. Um, <laughs> you just come out and there's no one there, apart from me <laughs> and a tomato. <laughs> then I don't have to do it then, if no one's there. Oh, I think you should anyway, even if it's just me. Okay. All right. Well, we can do that here. Yeah, but it's not so much fun. Okay. So... Yeah, come and say hello, though, is, is the thing. Mm-hmm. I think if you listen, come and say hi. Give, yeah. me, a, give me a hug. <laughs> yeah, tell us your name. Don't care, don't care how That's the thing, are. though, isn't it? Because everyone's got different pictures on Twitter and they'll mm. come up and go, because they know us. We don't know them. Yeah. As, we don't know their faces. So it's going to be a bit. So they need to come up and go, I'm such and such. Mm. And I'll be like, ah. <laughs> on the Saturday night, I will accept drinks just to make a point. Uh, you are so <laughs> easy. <laughs> Also, if you are uh, on the tables in either of the venues mm-hmm. selling your stuff, we will be coming grabbing you for some chats. Yes, be so prepared. Be prepared to sell your wares on the microphone. Yep. We will we be will. grabbing you, literally. Ooh. In a non-sexual way. That's better. Please don't call the relevant authorities on me. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll be coming and getting chats and getting as many as we can uh, so we can play out the mm-hmm. following episode. Yep. After that, we're going to have a couple of weeks of um, talks mm-hmm. from the festival. Yep. And then we'll, we'll kick back with a new season. New season. A you new ready, season. Ready to count down again. Yes. Yes. Another year. Another one. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for listening. We will see you all in a few weeks if you go in. Yes. If not, you will form. hear a load of us being there. <laughs> um, next episode will be slightly late. It's going to be around the 17th because we need a day or two to get it all together yeah. from the festival. I apologise for our tardiness. <laughs> yeah, because it, the festival finishes on the 14th. Yes. Um, we, yeah, there won't be enough time. No. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much for listening. We'll see you on the 17th. <gasps> Thank you for listening. Find out more about the festival at comicartfestival.com. Find out more about the show and how to contact us at comicartpodcast.uk. Find us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Music composed by Pop Noir. This podcast is part of Brit Pod Scene, an independent network of uniquely British podcasts that's always growing. Check out BritPodScene.com or BritPodScene on Twitter to find out more. Oh.